got flour, milk, sugar, got, you know, it's got a lot of basic food. But it's good. Yeah. Yeah. And eggs. We can, yeah, we can add eggs. Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll. <laughs> So what are their Easter eggs, right? <laughs> nice. Yeah, spot the teacher. Our, our office is doing like a decorate an egg contest today, but because most of the offices in Calgary and us remote workers are not, <laughs> we okay. are not participating, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to log back in later to a teams full of these decorated little Easter eggs that we get to vote on. So they're supposed to be decorated like farm animals. So we'll see what we, how creative folks are. <laughs> All right, I believe the live stream started. So we're gonna call the meeting to order. Thank you everyone. And thank you those online that are joining us. Um, call the meeting to order. And as I said last week, we're gonna kind of share around the acknowledgement I did. I was at the event yesterday with uh, Tobin and I asked her if she would be so kind and she's agreed. So Tobin, if you would like to do the uh, uh, acknowledgement, please. I'd be happy to. We acknowledge with respect the spirituality, history, and culture of the Anishinaabe, the people of the three fires known as the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations who have inhabited this land from time immemorial. And further give thanks to the Chippewas of Saugeen and the Chippewas of Nawash, now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. We also recognize the Métis whose ancestors shared this land in these waters. May we all, as treaty people, live in respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all its diverse peoples. And I believe there's time for a big reflection as, as well. Uh, World Water Day just passed on March 22nd. This UN designated day recognizes the global water crisis in which 2.2 billion people on our planet live without access to clean water, including some First Nations people in Canada. I think as municipal councillors and mayors and deputy mayors, we have the opportunity to use our voices to amplify underrepresented voices in our society. On May 16th, Autumn Peltier will be at the Roxy as part of the Grace Hubble Foundation fundraiser, which supports the Conservation Authority. And Autumn is from uh, Manitoulin Island. She was inspired by her great aunt, Josephine Madaman, who started the Water Walker movement. In total, Josephine walked 272 kilometers around, sorry, 272 kilometers around the Great Lakes over her time water walking. Um, Autumn continues uh, to work to do the same type of work as Josephine. In addition to water walking, she also has started speaking on behalf of the water, and her journey has taken her to UN summits and the World Economic Forum. So I ask us all to consider using our voices to learn more about water walkers uh, within our broader community and also closer to home, and to use our voices to ensure that people know that Autumn is coming to Owen Sound and have the opportunity to attend as teachers with their students during the day or the evening event uh, in, uh, as, on May 16th. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Naya. It was uh, insightful. Uh, disclosure, <laughs> disclosure of pecuniary interest. Is there any around the table or on the screen? Seeing none, uh, call for additional agenda items. Uh, is there anything additional anyone would like to add? Seeing none, call for the adoption of the agenda. Move that the Gray Sobel Conservation Authority Board of Directors approve the agenda of March 27, 2024. I have a mover and a second. Member Bell and Member Mackey. Thank you. And the approval of the minutes of uh, February 20th. Oh, I should no, let's do that with that. All in favor. Thank you. Uh, and the approval of the minutes of uh, February 28th, 2024. <coughs> Move that the Greg Selville Conservation Authority Board of Directors approve the full authority minutes of February 28, 2024. I have a mover and a second, please. Mm -hmm. Member Maxwell, Member Greg, any comments or questions? Seeing none, may I have a vote on that? Okay, thank you very much. No business out of the minutes at this time. So we'll move to the delegation. We do have a delegation today from the town of the Blue Mountains. Uh, Pamela Spencer.
he'll have a presentation and if he's able to load it up. My name is Pamela Spence. I'm oh, my apologies. Okay. I had a picture on my page. <laughs> Sorry. I noticed that. But I'm from Craig East in the Townsley Mountains area, and I think it's very timely bringing up the water. I'm here to talk about the water in Nautilus of Osaka Bay. So I have made this presentation to the Town of the Mountains and uh, to the Blue Mountain Watershed Trust, and I'm on schedule to speak with uh, the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority and hope to get into Gray County. It's not yet scheduled. So I'm here just to um, speak to the water and the runoff and the concern I have for the sedimentation in the bay. Next slide, please. Just take a second to catch up. Um, where I live, I am within a, a kilometer either way. I have uh, six water courses that run from the escarpment down into the bay. And as a, just a resident in the area, I've documented some pictures over time, and I wanted to share this. Um, the, uh, we, technical difficulties, bear with us, sorry. <laughs> okay. It's not a complete documentation. I was away for May. Um, I sort of started putting the presentation together in August, so we all know that there's a runoff from the escarpment into the bay, um, but it's more than a freshet. It's not just a spring occurrence. And I just wanted to highlight that it's really become um, a very frequent uh, effect, and the impact on the bay is very concerning. Um, the, you know, the town talks about clear and crystal waters, and while that may be true at times, it's very much a problem. Next slide, please. If that doesn't work, Tim, I can try it from here. I do have the presentation. Yeah, if you would, otherwise I have to stop sharing and share again each time. Okay. So this is a picture at the end of June off of North Games Beach, which is one of the major public beaches in the town of the mountains. And you can see that there's quite an impact of the sedimentation running off into the bay. And this has occurred through July and August as well, as when we can get some pictures. <laughs> Let's see some of that. Next one, please. So there's a just a map from Craig Leith. Um, I live where that um, picture is. So between um, Gray Road 19, which is the road running through the G there, over to the west side of Fraser Crescent, there are five or six water courses that are full time, um, filled with water once described as intermittent, but it's always got water in it now. Next slide, please. My uh, neighbors who've lived in, I've lived in my property for 20 years, my neighbors who've lived there longer and um, have noticed a great change in the infilling in the bay and have sent notices to the town. Um, they say that it's the Conservation Authority and the Ministry of the Environment who needs to address this and if we see any culprits we should call them. But again, I think it needs a more concerted scientific uh, attention on this. Next slide, please. So, as I said, you know, it's, it's normal to see runoff and sedimentation in the spring. And this is water course 10, and out in the bay, the effect on that. Next slide, please. But we've seen a very heavy sedimentation load in June. Um, again, there's, I don't know the sources of this. It comes from the escarpment down and fills in the bay. And June 26th, I mean, that's half a kilometer out into the bay with this sedimentation. Next slide, please. The speed and volume of the water is concerning. And so because of the speed and the volume, it moves out into the bay quite considerably. Again, this is in July, hot, when, hot summer weather, and you want to get into the water, and you just, you're reluctant because you don't know what's in the bottom. You can't see the bottom. The water content is very disturbing. Next slide, please. So I was very fortunate. A friend of mine has a small plane, and we went up in the plane <coughs> in 2022. And as you can see, the escarpments in the back with the ski hills, um, heavy development, and then a green ridge for the Nipissing Ridge, and then the lower flatlands. 
But really the concern is you can read the waves of sedimentation in the bay, and um, unless we address the runoff from the water courses, I'm quite concerned that in a short period of time, the bay will be quite filled in. We gave up our boat because it's getting very shallow. Um, next slide, please. The Town of the Mountains has created a drainage master plan, which they're in their process of working on. Um, this is just a section. I tried to put some of the maps together just to show you the water courses that are really at the bottom of Nottawasaga Bay. They have identified culverts and, um, you know, will address deficient culverts, but the message in their master plan is to convey to the bay. And I'm trying to draw attention to we need to hold up the water courses a little bit so that the sedimentation, you know, settles out a bit and that there isn't so much um, uh, velocity to the water draining into the bay um, and creating erosion en route. Next slide, please. So this shows you, uh, this was from a, the drainage master plan again, um, drainage act assessment actually, um, and it highlights just sort of the, the area of the watershed of these four. I kind of estimated that the water court, or watershed 11 is at least 75 hectares, if not greater. So it's a huge volume that's um, draining into this area and heavily developed. Next slide, please. So again, I'm just visually showing you the, you know, the, the velocity of the runoff, the sedimentation, the bed load in there, and again, this is what, of course, 11 that flows into North Winds Beach, which is a public beach. Next slide, please. Oh, this is the video. Um, so, again, that day at North Winds Beach, if it's able to play, this is just spans or pans across so you can see just how deep into the, the bay this goes. That's fine. It's not going to play. Yeah. All right. So, this is Water Course 10, which um, on the left is a culvert at the base of the tunnel of the Craigley Ski Club at their north parking lot. But you can see on the right, two months later, it's still very heavily sedimented. It's not just a spring. <coughs> Next slide, please. This is what, of course, non the services a watershed of over 75 hectares. And April, in the middle there, it's muddy, but June, it's just as muddy and fast flowing. Next slide, please. This is a, an image from the Toronto Ski Club, the north end of um, Blue Mountain Resorts. And they were doing some work on snowmaking, piping, etc. And while there's some silt fencing there, it's not really doing much. So the runoff from that is impacting the um, drainage into the water course seven. Next one, please. And this was a bit of just, you know, to show you the volume, the speed, the velocity of Water course seven, and from here it's just 100 feet to the bay. Next slide, please. So I just really wanted to draw attention to the concerns that I have um, with the volume of the water courses. There's um, so much runoff from them that the quantity and velocity of the runoff is affecting the bay. With the velocity, there's erosion and sedimentation occurring. The turbidity in the water is great and undesirable for swimming. A um, little concern what's in the snowmaking um, and chemicals from either fertilizers during ski racing or from the top of the escarpment. Um, if the chemicals are what could be fertilizer, etc., that's going to increase the algae and aquatic weeds growing in the, in the bay. Um, there is a potential for beach and shoreline degradation and perhaps closures if the if the sedimentation is as bad. Um, the bed load in the runoff is creating plumes way out into the bay, and I think that's affecting the aquatic wildlife. There's, you know, lots of wildlife li living in the bay, as I'm sure you know. And the Town of Blue Mountains official plan review um, in their background study on climate change anticipates that runoff and erosion is going to just increase due to climate change and the 
ferocity of the, the storms that we have and um, the dry winters that we have make the soil more solidified so it's harder to absorb the rain when it comes. So it's quite a concern. And again, this is an August picture. I'm gonna, next slide, please. So I'm here to ask if um, municipalities and municipal organizations can recognize this as a problem and put into their work plans the money and resources to study erosion and strengthen the policies to improve watershed planning um, and reduce the impact from the water courses onto Georgian Bay and Nottawasoc Bay. So I'm asking that we change the mantra from convey to the bay to clean convey to the bay. Um, I'd like to study and monitor the, water, the runoff from at least these water courses, if not a broader water course base. Uh, measure the sources, causes, volume, speed, and bed load of the runoff from the top of the escarpment out to the bay. Implement measures to slow the runoff through the watersheds via making more pools when you approve development and there's riprap being dropped in. Maybe they can make better dams and slow the water down and um, allow their more sedimentation to settle out. Uh, in the town of Blue Mountains, the official plan has a 30 meter setback from the top of the bank. I know that's been compromised in a number of developments and I think it's important to enforce that where we can um, and require better erosion filtration with more um, hay bales and coca mats and erosion control blankets and things like that. So when you're approving developments, there should be strengthening of those filtrations. So again, just wanted to reiterate, we, have, we should improve our watershed planning, improve our policies on cleaning the water before it gets into the bay, um, create and improve uh, engineering standards and low impact development um, solutions for new developments is really something, again, I'm trying to hammer home at the town of the mountains. Um, and uh, just really look for your support to uh, move forward on some of these initiatives. Thank you very much. Last, last slide. It's just thank you for your attention, and um, we hope we can improve this going forward. Well, thank you for your presentation, Pamela. Well, it's, um, I can honestly say I drive for me for calling one off. And I, I, it is visually obvious that you can you can see that. So it's it, there is something there. Um, I'm going to throw it open to questions from the board. Anyone have any questions for this one? Member Greg. Uh, and they, not directly to Ms. Spence, um, but uh, I think there's probably a boundary within some of the mapping here that exists between us and not of the saga. So I'm just wondering through Tim, or through the chair to Tim, is there, uh, like are we compatible with not of the saga in terms of land use planning, uh, mapping, current mapping, um, that's kind of across that spans this area or is there any irregularities that currently exist? I'm not aware of any irregularities. Most of the area that's being shown in this presentation is within Great Salt's watershed. So our the watershed boundary between Nautilusaga and ourselves along the shoreline is roughly um, is roughly at the county divide. Just uh, like our watershed goes just the right, end. but slightly to the east of the county divide and. But that roadway between the two counties and, and between the two municipalities is roughly the watershed boundary. Great road plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have similar, but to a much smaller. No, no, actually, it's fairly considerable. It used to be more so in Owen Sound, uh, where the elevation change uh, from the East Hill uh, to the northern northeast boundary of the city uh, at times would supercharge the runoff. And uh, we've established what's locally known as the Kenny Drain, uh, but we've got a series of stormwater management ponds that exist too, trying to uh, filtrate that water flow or, or um, you know capture it, slow it down. What type of current plans exist when it comes to stormwater management practices or ponds? Um, 
the, the planning applies in this area as that we currently have. Uh, similar to using the Kenny Drain as the example, that's the municipality's valley road. Okay. So especially after Bill 23, our focus is natural hazards. So I could just um, keep on too, I've been involved in, so my background is in environmental studies and planning and business, and um, so I've been monitoring a couple of developments in the area. And the stormwater management plans associated with new developments are great, but again, I'm talking about these water courses that drain that don't have any controls on them. Anymore. Anyone else? Um, Member Day? Uh, uh, through you, Chair, oh, you. to Leo Lanky, you've already started answering the question. Um, I felt like it might be good to, it's hard to track for citizens what's happening with the conservation authorities and what is our mandate and what isn't our mandate, mandate anymore. Um, so it might, if you could provide a quick summary of I, and the rest of this meeting might be of interest to the team. Where we're headed, uh, I think that comment that natural hazards are the mandated main focus, and any natural heritage work, correct me if I'm in, in wrong, is done by choice through the municipalities as a Category 3 program that's not required. Through you, Mr. So yes, natural hazards is one of our mandatory focus areas. Uh, natural heritage is not optional for us. We are not allowed to do it. Um, the province put uh, wording right in our legislation that forbids us from being involved in natural heritage on a planning act application or anything outside of the scope of natural hazards and drinking water. Sources. I think what I should have said was watershed health, uh, which would be responding to some of and that's where the distinction between watershed health sure. and responding to any hazards coming out of this situation sure. might be hard to figure out. Sure, so very high level uh, changes to the Conservation Authorities Act that uh, have happened over the last couple of years. Our program areas have been broken down into Category 1 mandatory programs, Category 2 municipal programs, and Category 3 other programs. So the mandatory programs and services are natural hazards and the things that uh, go along with that. So uh, that's review of planning applications, issuance of permits for development. So both of those are uh, looking at developments that are about to happen, not developments that have already happened. Uh, we do um, flood forecasting, and we operate some flood and erosion control structures. Uh, so that's the natural hazards piece of it. Uh, we have management of gray sobble owned properties. And so for other conservation authorities, it would be their own properties. Uh, drinking water source protection. And, um, and then um, we have some watershed monitoring, but the mandatory piece of that is very specific to areas the, minister, uh, the ministry rather has designated. So there are 10 sites throughout the 3,200 square kilometers that we have that are designated by the Ministry of the Environment, and those are our mandatory water quality monitoring. Um, category two is not really relevant in this instance, and then category three, the other programs and services um, some of the things that could apply here are the expansion of the water quality monitoring program that we do. However, this is very different than, than that. So what we do is we have good coverage of the entire watershed, 3,200 square kilometers, and we don't target uh, rain events, we don't target uh, pollution specifically. We, um, we go out every three weeks or so through the ice-free season to collect samples and then that's sort of that's intended to be a long-term record of data um, to provide a picture of the, the watershed more greatly. Uh, it doesn't get in; it gets into nutrients, but it doesn't get into things like fertilizers and pesticides. So those are extremely expensive to sample for. The other thing that would apply in this general scenario is the stewardship program that we run through Category Three, and so that's uh, working with landowners on a voluntary basis to do things like riparian stream planting, cover crops, uh, barnyard diversion. So a lot of that program currently focuses on agricultural uses and trying to make sure that those water courses uh, going through agricultural systems are in a better shape. So similar to what we're talking about here. Um, so, there, so when we start to talk about focused sampling or uh, doing works in the stream or providing comments to municipalities on stormwater management controls or 
uh, water quality, some of those things are no longer within the framework of our um, Thank you. I feel like it's hard you have that much to learn, <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably the two-year time that I do, clearly. So uh, I've been sitting in these meetings for two years now. <laughs> um, and I just have, if I may, sure. one more follow-up comment. I'm really grateful you're noticing what's happening in your neighborhoods and to Georgian Bay. And someone from our from the Georgian Wells Climate Action Team the other day said something that I feel like could apply here, where we've had some We've, there's been some successful actions in Georgia Bluffs recently because there is commitment from staff and council and volunteers. So I encourage you to keep doing what you're doing and keep advocating for what feels important because I, I don't know that change is always possible without one of those three. Uh, and always calls me the, the legs to the stool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. Um, if I may respond. Um, as Mr. Maxwell will know, I'm, I'm regularly following what's going on at the Town of the Mountains, and um, because I've had some experience with the province and work and planning background, I know things are changing, and I appreciate that this is, you know, new frontier for everybody to navigate. And um, but I think in terms of approvals and permitting, there's an opportunity to kind of try and address these things, um, and you know, what we treat farm operations um, with great care. This is, we're in an area where there's all these ski clubs and as we have fewer winters and less snow and more snow making, again it's a, a thing that we need to sort of pay attention to and figure out if it is, I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying we need to understand the consequences of all this and add it to our climate change worries sadly. But, um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Member Farmer, I believe you have a question. Uh, yes, two questions, um, probably f uh, through the chair to Tim. Um, just building off of Tobin's question there, is there any aspect of this that would fall under what the GSCA does and can do, or does that fall more uniquely to, or more specifically, to municipalities and provincial environmental um, responsibility? As a first question. Uh, I can't say 100%, but what I can say is some of the things listed on the, uh, the I'll call it call to action are specifically um, Ministry of the Environment or, or DFO, also, uh, sorry, Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So, in terms of if there's a concern about uh, pollution coming in, whether it's fertilizers or pesticides or even sedimentation, uh, <coughs> That is Ministry of the Environment's realm to, to look at that. And we, so as I mentioned, we wouldn't do site specific targeted sampling for something to try and find a, that uh, problem area. Typically, that would be the ministry. Um, in terms of uh, you know, engineering standards, LID, um, wetland policies, uh, maintaining culverts, those are really municipal things to look after. So wetlands, we used to have a lot more say in. Uh, that just keeps getting scaled back and back and back. So right now we are looking at natural hazards. Typically we're working, well not typically, we are working um, at the front end and not at the back end. And so what I mean by that is when a development is coming in, that's when we're seeing it and commenting on it. Uh, we have very little uh, ability or mechanism to deal with something that exists. So a historic problem, an ongoing problem, we have very little mechanism to go in there and do anything about that. So that's where our stewardship program could come in with willing landowners, right? If we had willing landowners that said, okay, the problem is the speed at which the water is getting into the stream, and the reason for that is that the streams are either paved right up to the edge, or they're tilled right up to the edge, or they're mown right up to the edge. And there's an opportunity to enhance that, pardon me, enhance that buffer area. Um, that's somewhere where we can conceivably be involved, and we uh, we run our stewardship program largely through uh, grants. Now that being said, if the municipality said that this is really important to them and they want to drive and fund uh, watershed management plans or uh, 
something else along those lines, we're happy to talk with the municipality and see if there's uh, if there's any way we can help with this. But it, it's a lot of this is going to be category three, and so as the board's aware, that becomes resource dependent on, in this case, probably the town. Do you have a follow-up, John? I see your hand. Yeah, up. and and maybe a, a just a secondary question there. With the grant that was applied for that would um, that would see us map the shoreline for the entirety of, of the area, do concerns like this fall under any part of the scope of that project or is that, yeah, uh, yeah is there any overlap or potential for overlap there? There are you, Mr. Chair? Uh, no, there's not. So that grant would be for the modeling of shoreline hazards in terms of wave action and wave erosion on the shoreline. Any other questions? Mr. Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for your presentation. And uh, it's troubling, isn't it? It's uh, going to become frustrating for somebody, you know, such as yourself. You said that you've lived there for a long time, a fairly long time. And from what you were witnessing, it you know caused you to start taking photographs to do some documentation of it. In one of your pages, it says that maybe some better erosion filtering, the hay bales, some socks, and I take it that whoever's doing some development, they already put those kinds of things in place, but they're not really working that well. It's not that they're not doing something like that, it's that the measures need to be increased somehow. That is your point? I have lived in the area for 20 years, and um in the last four or five years, there's been much more development and activity and construction going on, whether it's at the resort or at the lower lands. Um, yeah. And I know that there has been some riprap put in in Watercourse 10, um, but you know I haven't seen the, fil the silt fencing that plastic wrap is, in my estimation, pretty much useless. It's a good wind stop, but it breaks down in rain or um, any kind of construction, or if there's sediment that washes against it, it collapses right away. Um, but cocoa mats and hay bales are minimal where they're, where they're at, so the water, just like you know, makes its way around, and it, you know, it's not as effective as it could be. If there were layers of it or you know, sequencing of it, um, again, from my construction background, I think that that's at least part of a solution there. And I will say that in um, Gray Road 21, which is in the Nagwasaga Valley um, area jurisdiction, along the east side of Gray Road 21, they have dropped in um, various rows of riprap so that it's kind of tiered the water. And that's really helped. It was quite fast in eroding um, the shoreline there, and I don't know who did it, but it's in that Nautilusaga Valley um, jurisdiction, and that really, to me, is the solution. It just kind of dams up the water, slows it down, lets some of it settle down, so if you have a tiered effect, it really, you know, gives a good result in the end. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's a big concern all the way around. Um, I was wondering with your history of uh, li living there, we see over in Meaford out of the Big Head River this time of year water. We, we will see photographic. They'll look very the same. Like there's sediment in the water and the wave action comes in, but it dissipates, you know, within a period of time. You, are you seeing you give a series of photographs? This is sort of like, I got the impression this is ongoing nearly year round. Is, is that a rate of pressure? Um, if I could take pictures today, I would show it again in sort of a spring expectation. But the challenge is that you see it in June, July, August, yeah. September. Yeah, it's a big deal. Thanks. There, there are no more questions. Thank, oh, sorry. Member Greg. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I just, this is really, it, Member Bell, I think I spoke to it. I mean, if you were a farmer and you looked at that chocolate milk, Exiting your land, that's your top soil. Uh, and you'd be probably upset, or should be. Um, 
And I certainly don't. I'm very troubled with this. Uh, there's been deputations that I've had over the years where I, you know, I, I'm like, I might disagree. Uh, I can say no, whatever. I'm certainly on your side here. And the last thing I want to see is you feeling like nobody is advocating or taking, you know, taking this on. You kind of mentioned in the past you um, been passed, I don't want to say passed off, but uh, Blue Mountains hasn't responded maybe the way that you were hoping and you came here. Uh, I don't want you leaving here thinking that nobody is going to take on what everyone sees as a problem. Because I think even the Premier, if he come up and looked at that, he would say, that's not right. Yeah. That, that's, that's not right. Somebody has to champion it. And even if it requires a report back from staff in terms of what measures that we can advocate for on your behalf here, uh, I'm willing to, to move just to have providing staff the opportunity to report back and not off the cuff. Um, because I think somebody has to be a champion on it. And I feel like you haven't yet seen that person. Um, in terms of what partnerships in the future we can uh, look to engage with the town of Blue Mountains to strengthen this, um, this area, um, that's something that I would certainly uh, I move at this time that staff are able to report back on any opportunities for uh, working with others, uh, any steps, any measurable steps we can implement to, to move forward on it and not let it continue down the path I think it's going to. So, Thank you for that. Um, CAO on that hand, we, we did discuss this just prior to the meeting and it's true, awareness is, is part of the is part of the solution, is knowing what the problem is and then moving forward. We did discuss, yeah, the possible potential of this going to a staff level so they can at least look and see because GSEA, as member Day has indicated, there are so many more measures that are coming in that are literally tying hands that are making it more difficult, which is unfair unfortunate, not to mention as well that some of these things do not even fall under the auspice of this body, but more than this county or county. But nonetheless, you're right, this should necessarily go to the staff level so they can examine it as an information piece, so that they can determine if things can be done in concert with the municipality or the county to see if there's any solutions that we can offer. So if Member Greg is willing to make that motion, can we have a seconder for that? Member Day? A question or am I asking you all in favor already? Question. Sure. So do we understand what the problem is? And thank you for the presentation. The pictures are excellent. But you mentioned development. Is that what's causing all of this to be coming down? Or are these natural water courses that are just running constantly and picking up a lot on their way down the escarpment? Like, do we understand what's causing, where's this water coming from to start with? I guess would be my question. Because that might explain where we can go to find a solution. Rebecca? I don't want to play devil's advocate here, but I grew up in Thornbury, so I grew up on a stream that flew, flowed down from uh, the uh, down into Thornbury, and every spring that stream looked exactly like those do, primarily because the land is clay. There's a lot of clay land over there, so it turns the, the cricks that color in the, uh, in the spring. It changes color later in the year. I traveled that creek as a kid, you know, day in, day out. In the Craig Leith area, part of the reason it doesn't disperse is because the waters are very shallow there. You look at the rest of the Bay Area, it becomes deep quite quickly, and it dissipates that, you know, off of me, but it dissipates a lot differently than it does at Craig Leith. Craig Leith often looks that way. I mean, I can remember as a kid driving and calling it all the time. It's just the way it is because of the development, I'm sure, is having some impact on it. And that's a, Blue Mountains development is having an impact on a lot of things, um, pros and cons to it. Um, but I'm just not sure that this is a condition that has occurred just in the last 20 years, based on my first-hand information of growing up over there. Dr. Maxwell? I'm going to make a comment. 
comment that <clears throat> may add to the question about do we understand all the, the history behind this. I think the Kremlin area in particular, where Pam was talking about, is going through significant development uh, pressure. And in order to understand part of the, of the problem that you're seeing with the self-management and, and uh, water quality in general, you need to have a hard look at the land drainage act and how it applies to urban areas and its relationship to the intermittent and permanent watersheds in, and the retention ponds and how that all applies to, to the de development scenario. It's a very complicated issue. Um, I do know that at the council table I, I asked a question about water quality. Basically the response was we deal in water volume, not water quality. So it's a, uh, and the municipality, because the developers petitioned the municipality, X and all of them, you become a partner in it. Whether you like it or not, it's just how it works. So there needs to be, like, a, in order to investigate this thoroughly, you need to have a real deep dive into that whole, how that all came about. I only know bits and pieces because it started long before I was on council, too. So it's, um, I don't know how you craft the motion. I remember Greg, but well, I think it would be appreciated, though, for a greater understanding for everybody. And all at the Meeper, particularly Meeper coming up in the crosshairs, our Great Highlands. And uh, you need to understand these things. So that brings us full circle to the motion, which we've already had. And I don't know whether Valerie has managed to capture that or if Member Craig would like to take a shot at clarifying that. <laughs> well, but I, I, I'll leave the motion as it stands right now because. Sure, you do. Uh, firstly, staff are able to report back on the practice as it is, any potential outcomes that, that can be generated, and land drainage act questions or similar questions of different, uh, I don't want to say pieces of legislation, but um, foundational type of things that maybe are uh, no components to this. I don't know. I think it is development driven, or at least it's partly development driven. Um, and it's supercharging the run runoff. The, the photos aren't just springtime. Everything's changing. Um, and if the land drainage act or, or other uh, instruments play a role, then, then the staff report might reflect some of the different items that contribute in different in different ways, some way, shape, or form. Uh, so I think I'll just leave it as a broad reporting back on the status quo and the deputation, what we've seen here, and um, certain partnerships that do exist now, any opportunities to enhance the partnerships, Tim spoke to stewardship um, steps that the CA has done over several years, any opportunities that we can further for seeking grants or so forth so thank you thank you um through you mr chair member greg if we could scope if we could scope it down to just yeah. staff will bring back a report on this yeah. i'm not inclined to get staff to give me the legislative pieces that we don't oh that's that's yeah. exactly what i meant okay. yeah yeah like that's cool. who knows how far it goes so right. if there's any further questions it's an outcome of the next of the staff report perfect um, that we're doing, you did for a second hand grant, or are you I are considering? I, yeah, I was just worried a little bit about scopes. This is so that was great, but I, I have another question. But uh, we can deal with the motion first. Okay, any other discussion on that? If not, I'll call. Oh, sorry, Mr. Mack. So I, I thought I heard 
Tim clearly say that it didn't fall within our mandate. So I'm not sure why we're asking staff to bring back a report on something that isn't within our mandate. My understanding of that response was that there are slight touches that we have, not necessarily, again, taking away the legislative aspects, but it is within our watershed, and anything that we can do to assist the municipalities in, in mitigating this kind of thing is, I think, this, taking this from an informational, informational perspective to look at to see if there is anything that falls under our auspice that we can do, we can look at at least that. But yeah, we cannot make any broad promises here because our scope is so limited. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't necessarily at least investigate what we might be able to do to help. That I think that's more the direction of the uh, the general flavor of the motion, not let's take heart and and, and change things. I think our staff are busy enough as it is, but have to believe it that. <laughs> Never got the problem. Can we just clarify exactly what the motion is? Because that's where I'm a little puzzled. How far are we going? And I see Valerie sitting there going, I don't know. <laughs> so let's just clarify exactly what we're going to vote on. Keeping it as simple as possible. We had a great seminar yesterday about simplicity. Yes. Yeah. Makes it much Clarity. more. Yeah. No negative yeah. words. Correct. It's that staff report back on the deputation on current practices and opportunities for uh, future steps that could be considered by the Conservation Authority. And to speak to Member Mackey's concern there, it's something that down the road, at least Ms. Spence or someone else who might have similar concerns can take to the next individual to say, I went to the Conservation Authority, here's as far as they can go someone has to champion this it's not in their bag um it's in the emily you know that we flushed it out from a conservation authority's perspective number day and then i'm going to call them <laughs> uh, i just wanted to bring loop back in the idea that there are optional category three programs that if there was a possible partnership with the municipality to create a watershed health uh, management plan then that could maybe something that could be noted that could be highlighted in this report as well to let municipalities know there are options if we choose to take them. Okay. Are you, have you got that dog? <laughs> <laughs> I will call the vote then. All in favor. Carry. Thank you, Pamela. You've obviously given us much to talk about. <laughs> so, for a more quick question, Member Dubik. Thank you, Pamela, for coming. So, just, just a quick question, and maybe it's both to yourself and, and to Tim. Do we know if anybody currently is actually doing like monitoring, like getting some data along the, you know, in terms of the water quality, sediment, any of that? Do we have anything going on by any organization? I'm not aware of that. Um, as I said, I've talked with the um, Town of the Mountains, and as the advisors from GSC to the Town of the Mountains on environmental and watershed planning, you know, I see it as a partnership for sure, um, and a cooperative um, effort to work on water course and developments and um, engineering standards and things like that. But um, in the drainage master plan, I made a petition a couple of times to add that as a future scope of work arising out of that. Um, I haven't had a response back to that, so I'm I'm keeping up the championship, and I appreciate the partnership. <laughs> Thank you again, Pamela, for the presentation. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Good luck with your efforts. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone. Next, we have a presentation. Uh, T Wealth Management, Lake Kanopkin. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Yes, did. Oh, good. Good afternoon, everybody. Are we okay to start? Or 
Yeah, please. Okay. You. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Mike Malka from the Wealth Private Investment Council. Thank you for having me out today. Um, I've seen or met most of you in the past years, but I understand there's some new members. So, a um, little bit about my background. I've been overseeing this mandate since we took it on in 2015. <clears throat> I've been with the bank for uh, 20 years. Um, so, you bring a, a nice combination of experience and, and expertise to your mandate. Uh, just a little bit about my team. So I'm supported by two administrative assistants, Laura and Christina. Um, also have, we also have a non-profit specialist on staff uh, from our national office that we can engage for um, various uh, reasons. Um, recently, I know she had a, a, a chat with uh, Allison and, and Tim with regards to some of the of TV's uh, programs with regards to the environment and some of the grants that are available through T Bank, and um, so those are some of the areas where she can help some of our nonprofit organizations look at what financial um, opportunities there might exist from our programs. Um, this, her mandate is wider than that, but um, that's the kind of um, uh, example of an area where we can engage uh, Andrea into the relationship. So just a bit of an agenda today that I'd like to walk you through. Um, first and foremost, um, kind of reviewing our investment policy statement, which really outlines the boundaries that we're managing this mandate within. Um, we'll look at performance, and we'll look at the current asset mix of the portfolio. I do want to spend a few minutes on uh, how did we get here um, over the last few years, because it does set up some of the challenges that we see ahead, um, what we've just come out of. Um, and we'll shift a little bit to where we are today, some of the opportunities and challenges, a brief outlook on 2024, and then some concluding remarks and some things to, uh, to think about longer term. Um, so, good, good starting point is just again to take a step back and, and look at the mandate that we've been asked to, uh, to manage for the Conservation Authority. So I've just noted the, um, the current portfolio value at 1.626. Um, your starting point was $1.2 million, so there has been cumulative growth over the mandated time frame. Uh, but really, it's obviously to protect the capital. Um, most nonprofit organizations um, obviously can't afford to have uh, periods of time where capital gets eroded. So that's number one, is you know, preserve what you've, you've got and try to keep pace with inflation. And, and secondly, we are trying to generate some long-term growth with part of the portfolio as well. And that can be either to fund capital projects or operating expenses for the organization. <clears throat> the investment profile that we're using is what we call a balanced mandate. It doesn't mean your portfolio is equally split between stocks and bonds, but it does indicate you're kind of a middle-of-the-road investor. Uh, you have components of both safety and growth in the portfolio. I've indicated the, the range, what we call our equity range, 35 to 65%. That's the range that we're allowed to operate based on our views of the markets. And we kind of look at things over an 18 or 12 to 18 month time frame. And again, kind of tactically overweight stocks, underweight stocks. Um, and that's the range that we're allowed to operate within for a balanced mandate. Uh, the risk profile that's usually associated with a balanced mandate, uh, we would call it moderate risk. Uh, potential drawdown in any given year, 5 to 10%. Um, so think of that as your pain index. Um, it's not fun to go through those. We went through one of those in, in 2022. Um, but uh, that's just to give you, it's not a guarantee that you can't breach those thresholds, but so far we haven't breached that threshold. But it just, you know, based on our experience, that's the kind of downside you could experience in really difficult market conditions for this type of mandate. Expected rate of return, I've indicated 4 to 5%. That's net of fees on a rolling five year time frame. Obviously, it'd be nice for me to say every year we can guarantee you a 4 or 5% rate of return, but that's not realistic. But I think over rolling three, five, 10 year periods, uh, we can certainly um, meet that uh, expectation. The time horizon that we're working with is medium to long term. I know there's some some shorter term needs that are coming up for the authority with regards to the administration center. Um, but there is a portion of these funds that is, is still geared towards a long-term mandate. I have noted that we currently do have some funds set aside for the administration center. Apologize for the uh, spelling mistake on the center. Uh, I guess that will be forever on the internet now that uh, um, it's posted on the website. But um, and other considerations that we're using in the mandate is um, being that this is a, a type of organization 
we're using one of our responsible investing mandates for some of the equity exposure. So um, I think that molds well with what the values of this organization represent. And so we are using a, a responsible investing equity mandate for some of the equity exposure in the portfolio. Okay. I hope you can read this, uh, but I will try to highlight so you can't. Um, but, oh, you have it on your computer, so you can. Um, this is a performance update for the, the portfolio. I tried to highlight some of the key uh, time frames in yellow there that I wanted to focus on. So in the top middle quadrant, it's performance per period. And the one year number I've got highlighted there is 11.2%. Um, so that would be from last March to this March. So, um, you know, obviously we've seen a huge rebound in, in financial markets, particularly late last year and into this year. So um, that's wonderful. It certainly exceeds the our expected, our expected one year rate of return, but, um, or our expected longer term rate of return, but that's uh, that's a reflection of you're going to have some good years and bad years. In the last 12 months, is we've seen a nice rebound from from the declines of 2022. Um, if you go to the since inception returns, this is going back to when we opened the portfolio or started managing it in late 2015. Up until this past March, we've been averaging just shy of 4%. So that number is 3.99%. So that represents your annual rate of return from 2015 to March 2024. So on the very low end of our kind of expected rate of return, of 4 to 5, but, you know, all things considered, we're within spitting distance of that. And certainly like to see us get to the high end of that range um, in the near future. Uh, then I just highlighted, you know, what's happened in the last couple of years. Uh, we saw a nice recovery in 2023 when the portfolio was up 8.7 percent, and we're off to a good start in 2023 at 4.4 um, percent. So yes, a lot of uh, nice enthusiasm in the markets over the past uh, four to five months. And these are all net of fees and expenses, so this is the net rate of return. Uh, I just used this uh, graph to show you the current asset allocation for the portfolio. Um, so the, the blue quadrant would be uh, some of the excess cash that we currently have in the portfolio. So in discussions with Tim and Allison with regards to some of the expenditures that are coming up for the administration center, we have set aside um, some excess cash for, for possible usage for some of your expenses. So that, uh, that is why the cash balance is probably well, it is no higher than it normally would normally be. So um, I will continue to stay in contact with Allison and Tim to get a timeline of uh, you know when those funds might be needed and how much. But that's why the cash balance is sitting at around 10%. Um, the remainder of the portfolio is about 38% in bonds and then about 52% in equities across Canada, the U.S., and international with a North American tilt. Um, so we're we're certainly within our equity allowable range, um, kind of at the neutral point, right in the midpoint of, of 50% between 30 and 65. Okay. So uh, a little bit of a, how did we get here? So what, we're, what you're looking at here, the graph on the left is, is U.S. data going back to the early 80s, I believe, um, showing the gray tall bars are recessions, you know, the wider the, the bar, the, the, the longer the recession. And we've plotted the unemployment rates uh, across those uh, recessions. So it's quite intuitive that when you're in a recession, unemployment spikes. I really just want to draw your attention to the most recent recession we've had in, 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 in the global economy in, in 2020, when there was basically a, an induced shutdown of the global economy. Obviously, um, that started the recession uh, from the pandemic, and you saw unemployment spike upwards of 13%. This is U.S. data, but if you looked at any major economy, it would be the same. Um, so that's what happened. Um, to deal with that, central banks and, uh, and governments um, injected stimulus to businesses and individuals, took interest rates down to zero, and basically flooded the global economy with liquidity and money. And what you correspondingly saw, if you, uh, if you go to the far right um, column, was people had all this money and nothing to do with it, so they started to spend it. And we saw a huge uh, spike in U.S. retail sales. And um, the green bar is the pandemic. The lighter blue bar is what happened in the great financial crisis back in 2007 and 8, which was a, 
a much more gradual recovery. This was, you know, the economy shut down and it started and reopened and he saw that massive spike. So it was an immediate recovery that led to obviously um, demand for products and services and inflation. And that leads us to this, um, what central banks had to do. What you're looking at here is um, central bank action for the U.S. Federal Reserve going back to the 70s um, and how they usually, uh, what happens after the, there's a rate hiking cycle. And the far right is the most recent rate hiking cycle where interest rates went from zero basically to 5% in a matter of 16 months. It was the second fastest rate hiking cycle in history. Only the, the greater uh, fastest uh, would have been in the early 80s when we had a really nasty bout of inflation. So that's, that's the situation we're in. We went from zero to 5% interest rates, same in Canada. Um, because of the inflationary pressures that it built um, into the in the economy, so we're at this inflection point. Uh, interest rates are at these levels. Um, central banks have started to communicate that they're essentially done with the rate hiking cycle, and the next move will most likely be down, which will be welcome news for a lot of people and businesses and individuals. Uh, this is just plotting inflation, um, you know, high end, low end, and where central banks want it to be around two percent. We're currently sitting around, you know, low threes, high twos, not where central banks want it to be, but certainly we, they've made a tremendous per, um, progress from the eight and eight and nine percent inflation we saw at, at this point, at its highest point in 2022. So a lot of work's been done, but we're not quite there yet. Um, but certainly moving in the right direction. Goods inflation is certainly uh, moving in the right direction. Uh, services is a little bit stickier and is yet to get to the levels that they want to see it at. But uh, the key takeaway here is that we're getting close to where central banks wants to be and that will set up interest rate cuts going forward. Um, some of the implications though of these higher interest rates, we're just looking at two leading economic indicators they are called PMIs, Purchasing, Man Purchasing Managers Index, both for manufacturing and the bottom uh, chart on the left is services. Um, and you're looking at a basket of of OECD countries and just whether or not anything above 50 means um, you're in expansion, anything below 50 means you're in contraction. And the percentage of countries that are in a contracting PMI for manufacturing is at 68% and at services you're at 31%. So there is this global coordinated slowdown that's taking place right now. These interest rate hikes are having the intended effect of slowing the economy down, taking the pressure off inflation. But it is leading to, are we heading into a recession? And that's certainly a potential outcome. I wouldn't say it's a foregone conclusion yet, but generally, um, you know, the global economy is slowing and it's coordinated. Uh, far right hand column just shows expected GDP growth for Canada and the US for, for 2023, which is in the books in 2024. So expected growth rates are slowing, uh, but they're not negative. So that's a positive. We're still expected to grow, but grow at a slower pace, which is Probably not a bad outcome. Um, again, an interesting uh, inflection point here. Uh, you're looking at the rate actions of 51 central banks across the, across the globe, going back to 2020. Um, green bars are when central banks are cutting um, collectively, and blue bars are when they're raising rate hikes. So you can see, you know, in 2020 they were cutting. Most, most central banks were cutting to stimulate growth. We get into inflation. Through the 2021-2022 calendar year, central banks are increasing rates, and we're at the inflection point now. We're actually you're starting to see some central banks uh, cutting rates. So again, an inflection point should set up um, a better environment for both stocks and bonds in this rate cutting cycle that we hopefully will be entering into some point this year. Um, big component of uh, of inflation is is the labor market. Um, we're just, just looking at U.S. job creation data um, and the number of jobs being created is slowing. So again, it's taking some of the pressure off inflation and things are moving in the right direction um, as far as you know, the labor market um, kind of easing a little bit. People are not able to demand as much of a wage increase maybe when there was labor shortages. So again, it's just a, a nice tailwind uh, if you see some easing in the labor market for central banks to begin cutting interest rates. Um, okay, so just uh, some key market data here, looking at you know the end of 2022 to the end of 2023. 
just wanted to highlight a few things. Um, top quadrants, you just look at US and Canada, CPI, again, at the end of 2022, we were in the mid sixes. You know, we're at the end of 2023, we were in the mid threes. So inflation moving in the right direction. Um, if you just look at um, down the bottom, the equity market performance. Um, so you've got the FTSE, so the FTSE bond market is the first. So we saw nice returns for bonds last year, around six to seven percent. So very nice recovery in the bond market. Uh, U.S. equity market was up mid twenties. Canadian market was up uh, mid mid single digits eights. And you had um, Morgan Stanley Capital, that's the Europe, Asia, Far East markets. Up 15 percent. So basically, the broad takeaway was you had a broad rally across stocks and bonds in 2023. So um, a nice, a nice recovery after coming out of a, a miserable 2022. Um, I'm not going to read word for word here. Uh, it's Q4 highlights. I might skip that. Leave that with you. Uh, just give you some very granular information on the sectors that did well, and uh, you know we saw certainly saw a fairly broad based recovery in most sectors and industries. Um, I guess one thing on this slide, this is looking at bond yields for Canada and the US, looking at you know short-term 91-day Treasury yields to 30, so that's long-term. You can see that short-term rates are higher than long-term yields. So we have what's called an inverted yield curve, which is not normal. Central banks had to jack up short-term rates to deal with inflation, but you have this inverted yield curve. Normally you want to see an upward sloping yield curve. So um, it does indicate a couple things. The fact that long-term rates are lower than short-term means that economic growth is slowing. Inflation is expected to slow, <clears throat> and central banks want to get to a more normalized yield curve. So they're they're going to start to ease on the short end, and, and that will be certainly good for individuals and banks and businesses to get that uh, the short-term borrowing rate lower. Um, so expect to see that hopefully occur as we move forward. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about importance of bonds. Yeah, I mean, there's an element, obviously, this portfolio has uh, currently 40% of its assets in bonds. Bonds were miserable in 2022 and 2023. This is showing you the two components of bond returns, uh, the income being the dark green bar and the blue bar being either capital gain or capital loss if it's above the, the zero um, indice. So in most years, you know, most of your income is, is coming from just um, the yield uh, from the bonds, it was just a reflection of the interest rate environment. But going to 2022 and 2023, or certainly 2020, yes, 2020, 2021 and 2022, um, you had income, but you had capital losses that totally offset any benefit of the income that was coming from those bonds, and that made fixed income returns negative for those two years. You can just see over history, it doesn't happen very often. It was really a function of just how quickly interest rates went up in an 18 month time frame bond prices had to adjust to that environment. So as frustrating as, as bonds were for an investment asset class those two years, it's not typical. Last year was more of a typical year where you've got some income and capital gain growth. And I would say, you know, seven, like there's only a handful of times there where you're gonna have a negative uh, event and that's usually a rising interest rate environment. So there's, you know, bonds still play an important, uh, important point of the portfolio. You don't wanna give up on them despite a couple bad years, uh, they still have a place in a portfolio. And this is just an example of why you would traditionally have fixed income in a portfolio. We just looked at some uh, market events, you know, Black Friday, you know, dot-com bubble, global financial crisis, um, 2018 stock market sell-off, and then the pandemic. Uh, the dark green bars are the S&P 500 performance, so stock performance. And then what uh, U.S. Treasury bonds have done um, when the stock market sells off. And normally that's what bonds do. They offer you a ballast to volatility in the equity market. Um, didn't happen in 21 and 2022, but in most crises it does. So there's still a place for, for bonds to act as that buffer in your portfolio and why we still think it's an important asset class. Especially if we're into an environment where interest rates are going to make it stay a little bit higher for longer. Um, fixed income can be uh, serve as an important uh, component to your overall return. Um, quick executive summary: uh, we, so we have, because of the current environment, we do have a positive outlook on uh, fixed income, and would would suggest a modest overweight. We do like government debt, but we also think there's opportunities and in good investment-grade corporate bonds as well to pick up some additional yield. 
I would say our view on equities still remains a bit neutral. We're not to the point where we want to take, you know, 50% equity rating and overweight equities. We still think there's concerns about potential recession. There's certainly enough geopolitical uncertainty uh, coming election in the U.S. that keep us kind of thinking we want to stay a little bit caution, cautiously positioned within your equity range. And we're kind of keeping into that 50 to 50, low 50% range. But I, I would think our next move would be a higher allocation to equities once we feel a little more confident as to the outcome of the economy. Um, alternatives, that's our private asset classes such as private debt, private mortgages, private real estate. We don't have private real estate in your portfolio, but we do have some private debt and private mortgages. Um, and we think that's an important way we can add some value to the portfolio. Um, and we still have a positive outlook to private asset classes. They operate differently than publicly traded markets. They help reduce volatility. They can be an inflation buffer. Um, so for all those reasons, uh, we think it's important to have an exposure to alternative assets. Um, the only reason I haven't really incorporated it is the, uh, the real estate and infrastructure private solution is I'm still a little uncertain as to how much liquidity you might need in the, in the near future. So that's the type of asset class that's a little bit harder to get in and out of. And I don't want to put you in something and then have to turn around and you not be able to access as quickly as, as you may need it. So I'll work with Tim and Allison to get a better line of sight um, on just what your liquidity needs are. And if we can, and start to incorporate a little bit of exposure to, to the private infrastructure and real estate uh, solution that we have. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to um, just a few closing remarks. Um, I'll leave. Those things for you. Uh, some bad. So I just want to leave you with, you know, why do, why do you invest in stocks, um, and why we think it's an important component to your overall strategy. Uh, we're just plotting uh, U.S. GDP on the left. So the U.S. economy is close to a thirty trillion dollar economy right now, and we're plotting U.S. corporate profits on the right. There's there's obviously a direct correlation between as the economy grows, corporate profits grow. It's a fairly strong correlation that I don't think you can uh, can really argue. The far right column then plots U.S. corporate profits to the performance of the U.S. stock market. And again, there's a strong correlation. So my takeaways here is if we believe the, the global economy will continue to grow, corporate profits will generally grow, and equity markets will move higher. So this is the performance. This is your why you invest in stocks for the long term. There's, there's, a, there's a correlation there that's pretty hard to to uh, ignore, and I think you lose sight of that sometimes when you're in the middle of a crisis. Uh, that you know, why am I investing in this asset class? If you have a right time horizon, this is the reason why you invest in stocks. And I think it's important to remember that. And lastly, uh, again, just plotting U.S. bull markets and recessions, going back to the date we had. Uh, going back to the 60s, um, so a couple takeaways here. Uh, green bars are the duration of a, a bull market and how much return was earned during that bull market. Red are you know bear markets, which are market declines. Again, the width being how long the bear market is and the decline of that bear market. A um, couple positive territories. Markets go up more than they go down. There's more bull markets and bear markets. Bull markets have longer periods than bear markets and you have more upside during a bull market than you do in a, in a bear market downside. So if you can just keep that in mind that it's never pleasant to go through these downturns, but usually after a downturn you enter into a, a bull market which tends to be pretty favorable. So again, the case for remaining invested uh, in equities um, when you keep kind of these things in mind and not lose sight of why you're investing in that particular asset class. So I've covered up quite a bit. Uh, last thing, fee schedule fees are important. Uh, last year there was a question on fees. We were able to enhance our discount by another 5%. So we have a 25% discount to our standard fee schedule, which takes your fee to approximately 88 basis points on $1.6 million. So I think that's extremely attractive. I've, I've you know, certainly gone to bat to the extent that I can. Uh, to keep the fees manageable, and uh, I hope you feel that that's a fair fee for the value that we're delivering to the organization. So, with 
that, I will open it up to any questions on anything that we cover up. Thank you, Mike. So instead, you went to race, apparently. <laughs> I'm sure you've got quite good at explaining the COVID scenario. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure the board has questions. Uh, more about your crystal balls for the future. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Anyone? Member back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mike, thanks very much. And you touched on the fees, right? The, I was the one that asked the question with yeah. the fees, so on behalf of the board, we very much appreciate uh, your continued efforts to uh, keep those fees at a, a very reasonable cost, so we, we do appreciate that. Question in regards to, uh, so our asset allocation mixes, are, are we achieving those through mutual funds? And if it is through mutual funds, what are the fees on the mutual funds? And if it is through mutual funds, could we do it through uh, ETFs and avoid some of those management fees? So we don't use mutual funds. We use proprietary pool funds, which are similar to a mutual fund, but have the expense stripped out. You are paying a fee based on our fee schedule that I just showed you. So we're not going to use an additional fund, a uh, fund that has an additional fee embedded in it. That would be kind of like double dipping, and that's not what we're about. So all of our pooled funds that we use essentially just have operating costs associated with them. So you know your trading costs, they're they're basis points. So if you take a bond fund, it might have an operating cost of 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 percent. Nothing that's going to really take the, the fee schedule that you saw and add another half percent to it. So you're essentially getting, um, like, there's no fee with those pool funds, is basically what I'm trying to say. So you, you don't need to go to a, an ETF solution because uh, those would actually be more expensive than the pool funds that we're using. That being said, we are charging that management fee that you saw. So, but we're trying to give you active advice, and that's where um, we try to add value. Thank you. And my second question, if I, if I may. Mike, since inception, our, our rate of return has been 3.95%. Yeah. With some risk built into that. Right now, you can get a GIC rate that is guaranteed at 3.9, probably higher if you're really shopping around with a, a nice amount of money. So based on the historical average that we've been receiving, if we can get guarantee without risk, why wouldn't we do that? So you can do that for a particular term. Um, I'm not sure if that, if that was a five-year rate that you were quoting. Um, I think over time, we will beat that. Um, you couldn't get that rate two, three years ago. Interest rates were, let's just say, one to two percent at that time. <laughs> Now you're right, certainly GICs is a more viable option that you can certainly consider. I think that's a question as a collective board you could ask yourself is, you know, for the next three to five years, you want to just eliminate any kind of risk. You can lock into a GIC rate. When that comes due, most likely it's going to be at a lower rate that you're going to renew into, which is what we call reinvestment risk. Uh, first of all, I can't tell you exactly where interest rates are going to be. And, you know, three, four, five years, but I think they'll be lower from these levels because I think we're at peak levels. So you do have reinvestment risk that you're going to have to deal with. And you just have to make sure you have liquidity. So staggering, you know, if you were to consider that, to make sure you have GICs that are either cashable or coming due in, a, in the next one, two, three years. Um, so it's a viable option because, you know, those rates didn't exist two, three years ago. So again, good question that could be posed as to whether or not that's the direction you want to go in. Um, but I think, you know, the fact that we've seen the worst in fixed income and if anything, fixed income returns are quite attractive going forward, we're quite positive on that. I think we'll outperform a GSC over that time frame if we're looking at three to five year periods. But we won't know until five years from now, we look back and this is what Mike thought. Um, you can take some money, there's no reason why you have to do it all in GICs. You can take a portion and put it in GICs for that comfort or peace of mind. Uh, we do offer GICs, so that's something we can incorporate into the strategy. If you wanted to allocate a portion of the portfolio for GICs, there's no fee that you pay on it. Uh, it gets set in the portfolio, so it's there, but uh, it doesn't attract a fee because we're not really actively managing it. So it's it's an option. And so I guess it's a question back to you if, you know, if that's the route you want to go for a portion or all. It, it could be. But I think, again, these are long-term. I would defer back to those charts on equity markets and, 
and think that that's uh, a pretty compelling um, argument for having some allocation to athletes as well. Thank you for your comments. Any other questions? Uh, thank you. So, thanks for coming back. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so, just a quick question about the alternative yes. um, class. You know, sort of some private, some yeah. real estates. Um, so, can you just talk a little bit about uh, the profile of the alternative class like in terms of risk, return, yeah. etc.? And because you were saying that you may, you know, you're thinking of maybe we should be considering it. And so, why should we be considering it? Yeah, so the alternative solution that we offer can is a, is a, is a fund that has exposure to uh, infrastructure projects. So think of that as wind, solar kind of projects, which again, kind of molds well with the environmental um, aspect of this organization. So um, very stable uh, returns that come from that type of asset class when you look at infrastructure. It also include pipelines, you know, toll roads, transportation, those kind of projects. So they're long life projects that usually have contractual revenues associated with them. So they can provide, and they do provide, a nice steady stream of income. And usually those income streams are adjusted for inflation. So that you can, you're, if inflation is rising, so will the, the revenue from those income streams. So that's a, a nice mix to have. And they will, perform, they will perform differently than the publicly traded markets, which trade every day, the rear, re kind of, any given day can impact the, the price of a publicly traded asset. These assets don't change hands every day, um, and so there's less volatility. So what they can do is they just help smooth out your returns um, and, and give you a steady stream of income. Uh, with regards to the real estate side of the portfolio, it's um, I would say it's a multi, multi real estate strategy, so office, industrial, warehousing, um, multi-residential, um, and, and commercial. So a couple of those asset classes don't look that attractive, particularly office right now. Um, Retail is kind of up in the air, but certainly the warehousing, industrial, and multi-residential side of the real estate portfolio is performing very well. Um, so again, you've got a nice basket of, of different components within that real estate portfolio. Again, same, there's some, some very secular trends to industrial and multi-residential that are very attractive. Uh, I think office has a lot of work to, to work out. I would say the types of office um, buildings that we own in our real estate fund are what you would consider like grade A, where you know they've all been upgraded, they're energy efficient, and they're kind of the types of properties that are in demand. I could get the, the exact vacancy rate of our office portfolio, but it's in the high 80s, low 90s. So we're not seeing um, massive exodus on our office real estate portfolio. Um, it will perform similar to infrastructure as far as its characteristics, steady income, inflation protection, less volatility. So those are the reasons why they would be a nice um, buffer to the portfolio. And if you just look at any pension plan, whether um, or institutional um, pension plan, um, they're all including exposure to, to private asset classes for the reasons I just mentioned. Um, they just perform differently, um, steady income stream. And um, they're very attractive assets, a lot of them. So we're trying to incorporate some of that same thought leadership. Like TD Asset Management is one of the largest pension and institutional managers in North America. So we have a lot of thought leadership and expertise in what institutions and foundations are doing and how they're managing portfolios. And we're trying to induce, introduce some of those same concepts for what we do for individuals and for smaller organizations. So we, we do believe in the asset class and think it's part of, a, I guess, a well-diversified portfolio. So there is an additional cost to that portfolio of about a percent. So that's the one fund that we do have an embedded fee in it because it does require a lot more oversight and involvement to manage that type of asset class. And as a result, there is an additional fee for that real estate infrastructure portfolio that you, that you need to be aware of. But um, outside of that in the portfolio, nothing else really has an embedded fee. So I'm happy to share that and more information on that to, to Tim and Allison or to bring it to the next board meeting or, or so you have some more, more um, insight into that strategy. Thank you. Can you have a question? Dr. Maxwell? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so if, if, if you're from a school of thought, which I am, is that inflation probably is not dead. And I saw no appetite for governments to stop spending money. So I'm just wondering, what is the best way to shelter 
against inflation and still have growth? Yeah. So good question. Um, so like fixed, like normally fixed income wouldn't be a good asset class to, to protect against inflation unless it has the ability to adjust with the pace of inflation. But a traditional bond, when it's issued as a stated coupon, and you're stuck in that bond for the duration of its time frame. So that leads you to look at other asset classes. Equities generally have been an asset class that has inflation protection. Uh, certain commodities um, like oil, gas, grains, um, Things like that can be inflation protected assets. Uh, some of the real estate, like private asset classes that I just spoke about, can give you inflation protection. Um, you basically just want those kind of asset classes in your portfolio to help offset um, inflation because it could be stickier and higher for longer. Uh, that's certainly a potential outcome of you know whether or not we get back to two percent inflation or not is is where central banks, but they might have to basically say we might not be able to get back to two and the new run rate might be three or high twos. So I think you're going to be forced to be looking for some of those other asset classes that give you some protection against that. So we've incorporated some in your portfolio, but uh, again, we could incorporate a few other strategies to help protect against inflation as well. Yeah, thank you. There's no other question. The only one I might have is November 24 is looming. Yes. Um, and that's but the market obviously has, has historical highs, and just wondering how the banks are looking at the potential boring interest rates with the potential volatility of something coming in south would be somewhat crazy or different. Um, just how are the banks kind of viewing that um, long term view of direction? Yeah, I haven't seen anything published yet as far as our views on on the outcomes of the US election, as far as you know, if it's going to be a Republican Trump versus Biden Democratic. I'm sure what we're going to get, we're going to be seeing some more analysis on that. Obviously there's going to be winners and losers. It's not like I think even if Trump were to win, if it's going to, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a total disaster. He, um, so there could be winners and losers as far as sectors. Um, the market performed very well during his last um, presidency tenure. I don't know if it will do the same this year, maybe the blooms off, but um, we'll still have to wait and see. Um, but I will try to send some information as we uh, put it out with regards to our views on the election and the yeah, winners and losers. But as a firm right now, we're not positioning client portfolios for one outcome or the other at this point. We're just trying to really focus on you know, best quality investments that might be able to endure whatever outcome may occur. Because it's, you know, to try to pick winners and losers at this point might be a little difficult to do. Um, so that's what I would say to that, is we're more focused on just investing in the good quality companies um, that will endure whatever outcome. Um, and I will certainly try to send Tim and Allison and maybe some information on, on that if that's an interest for the group that can be maybe dis disseminated. Um, but I'm not seeing an overall let's position portfolios for this way based on this expected outcome. Um, it's a little early for, for that, I think. But it is looming, and I'm sure there's going to be market volatility. I think you can certainly um, guarantee that there's going to be some swings in the markets based on on, on how things are shaping up. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for the information. Uh, very valuable, and we appreciate you. Uh, okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the consent agenda. Um, I think from that, Member Mack. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, if we could just pull the expense report, please. Certainly. From February 1st to the 29th. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Duke. Our benefit, our overall payroll, which is 111000 and then we have an owner's contribution of 31000 group benefits of 13000 and uh, employee health tax and WSIB at 60000 Some of those amounts seem to be high unless we're paying on a more than a monthly basis. So, I mean, I guess through you to Allison, maybe uh, we could get a little more clarity on that, please. Sure, Mr. Chair, I can answer. Um, 
Yeah, the 60104 that you're seeing, that is a receiver general payment for 2K rule. Uh, 2K, sorry, in uh, January. And then employer health tax and WSAB on top of that. Our WSAB rate is 3.25%, which is up 0.1 over last year. Um, group health benefits, that is just one month, the month of January. Um, and the owners, the 31,000, half of that is deducted from employees' pays. So it's a, it's a matching contribution. The authorities paying about 15 5 and the employees are paying the other half of that. And the monthly payroll is, yes, on this. Thanks, Allison, for the. That clarifies the owner's portion for me. Can you just go back to the, the 60000 for employee health tax, which is 1.95% of, of payroll? Mm -hmm. Omer's typically is a, a dollar fifty per hundred dollars worth of. Uh, um, so where is that the 60000 Is that CPP remittances also in there? And what, what else is included oh. in there? That is both the employer and employee share of Canada Pension, Employment Insurance, and Income Tax. The bigger part of that is the Income Tax, which comes off the employee's pay. Thank you. Good. Is there anything else? I would move that in consideration of the consent agenda item listed on the March 27, 2024 agenda. The Gray Selva Conservation Authority Board of Directors received the following items. Number one, environmental planning section 228 permits, February 2024. Number two, administration receipts and expenses, February 2024. Number three, correspondence, GSEA donation letter, uh, GSC Foundation Earth Film Festival flyer. And I think that's everything. Unless I did not do that right. Yes. Uh, may I have a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Member Carlton, Member Gray. Any discussion? Member Dubik? Um, so, just putting in a plug for the Earth Film Festival. So, just get that into your calendars, please. It, it will be a great event, May 16th at 7 p.m. Buy your tickets online. Um, yeah, so please, there will, there will be uh, lots of great opportunities. There will be an online auction. Um, I just open. wanted to come for dinner, and then you have to go to the Roxy in person to buy your dinner and give you tickets. There you go. So we do hope everybody can, can join us. Anyone else? Um, the I was going to ask about attachment number six, which was the uh, donation from the Blue Ridge Enforcement Club, and they specifically requested that a portion of that be dedicated to um, a specific direction. I presume that's no problem. Okay, just wanted to clarify that. Uh, there's no other way. Sorry, Mr. Mackey. I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. I just saw Mike leave there. Um, we had information sent out from Valerie in regards to director information. Correct. That Allison, sorry, Allison, Allison, which was at the request of TD Wealth. I guess I'm unclear as to why TD Wealth requires this personal information of board directors, because I've not seen that occur in any other situation. Yeah, and I don't believe we did it last year. I don't remember signing yeah. something similar last year. I'll have Allison follow up. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Sorry. No, no, that's good. Um, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Moving into the business items. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Yes, I'm, sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry that I didn't mention this at the beginning of the meeting, but I have enough, a meeting in Wyerton at four o'clock, so I will be leaving this meeting around 3.15, 3.20. I just wanted thank to you. let you know. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry I did not mention that at the beginning. That's, that's okay. Uh, moving to the business item, number one, administration. Uh, 
with the uh, presentation by Tim uh, Landy, and I'll just read the motion. Or the recommendation is, whereas Grace Oval Conservation Authority, the government of the province of Ontario has introduced a new conservation area regulation, that the Grace Oval Conservation Authority Board of Directors receives staff report 006-2024 as information. Tim? If I could amend the motion. Certainly. Tim. Motion speaks too quickly. Um, it should just read, whereas the government of Ontario, or yeah, the was, province of Ontario, is a new conservation regulation. We can scratch. Good. When I read that, it didn't make sense. Uh, so, so anyway, this information shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. We did, I did mention in my CAO update last month that uh, we had just received a uh, notice from the province that a bunch of pieces of, well, two of the regulations were released. And several pieces of the Conservation Authority's active effort plan will come into force and effect on April 1st. And the next several reports you'll hear today are about those changes. This one specifically is about Section 29 of the regulation, uh, which deals with the rules of conduct uh, within conservation areas. So this is the legislation that deals with properties that we own as a Conservation Authority versus work that we do on private property. Uh, what I've included for you in the package is a copy of that legislation with the changes highlighted um, in yellow. So very little is different from what we currently have as a regulation to what we will have effective April 1st. One of the biggest differences is currently there are 36 different regulations for each conservation authority. There will now be one for all conservation authorities, but they read the same regardless. So it's a simplification of paper, really. Um, some of the biggest changes are clarification of items that maybe needed a little more depth. And then um, a lot of additional information on domestic animals coming onto Conservation Authority property. So this can largely be thought of as people with their dogs. I, I don't think we've ever seen somebody with any other domestic animal on our property. Um, so inevitably we do run into problems with people with dogs without leash, people not cleaning up after dogs. Um, you know, the, the dogs running all over the place. This isn't unique to conservation authorities. I'm sure municipalities uh, have the same issue in their parks, uh, but it is quite frequent in conservation uh, areas. So dogs on leash is not a new rule. It's always been there. Uh, but what has become more specific in this regulation is, in addition to dogs not being able to enter waters where people are waiting or bathing, uh, not bathing, swimming or waiting, uh, they also can't enter water now next to a campsite. This doesn't affect great problems. We don't have any campsites, but that has to do with people potentially getting drinking water from uh, from that water source. And then information on, uh, in addition to your dog not running off leash, uh, you know, the sorry, your domestic animal. Your domestic animal also shouldn't be harassing wildlife, destroying the property, uh, threatening or harassing other people or other animals, and you can't leave bags of dog poop or just non-bag dog poop lying around. So the legislation actually gets into that detail that you need to be a responsible pet owner, and if you're going to come to a conservation area with your pet, you need to take care of them and, and so on. Uh, it also goes into some other detail, though, that was previously missing, and it's great to have on uh, AODA type things. So if people need service animals, um, there are special rules that apply to service animals that don't apply to everybody else. So service animals do not need to be on, on leash. Um, they still can't run amok, but, but they don't need to be on a leash. And so that's defined in here too. Uh, so I won't go on any more about that. Uh, we will uh, talk to any affected staff about this, but like I said, it's largely the same as the existing Legislation and through you, Mr. Chair, I welcome any questions or comments from the board. Um, first, I'll make the amended motion um, and then we can entertain the question. So, whereas the government of the province of Ontario has introduced a new conservation areas regulation that the Solve Trace Solve Conservation Authority Board of Directors receives staff report 006 2024 information, may have a mover and seconder, please. Member Greg, Member Mackey, thank you. Uh, any questions? Then we're back to you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Tim, now included under the domestic animal is a horse, so lots of equestrian riders utilize our properties. Um, what is the expectation? I mean, it's difficult to have a bag big enough to clean up after a horse. So, what 
or the conservation authorities thoughts on the horse doo-doo? Uh, horses aren't permitted on any of our properties, so it's, it's, not. Be, should be it's not a permitted use on any of the grace office properties right now. But with the changes, if they're a domestic animal, will they be? No, there's, uh, I don't have it at the tip of my fingers, Mackie, but there is another item in here about uh, uh, horses. So if that's the case, can I ask why horses are not on our properties? Didn't know that. We are, we, I can't think of any good areas that we have that would be appropriate for horses as a multi-use on our properties. It, it's totally different from somebody hiking on a property. So for somebody to take their horse up English Falls, um, the trail system, that, that's what most of our properties are like. So off the top of my head, I can't think of any areas that would be appropriate. So it's never been listed as a, as a permitted use. Just off the top of my head, we have a number of forest areas uh, that are very solvable that do have trails through them that riders would say are very nice for their activity. So maybe it's, uh, I don't know if it's something that needs to be you know, looked at in a site to site specific cases. In Gray County, I, I don't believe discourages the use on any of the trails, but I'm not 100% sure on that, so just throwing it out there. And in contrast with that, is that posted anywhere? Like, would anybody even know that? They should. So the way the Trespass to Property Act works is what defines uh, what uses are permitted and not permitted on a property. And so if a property is posted with permitted uses, anything not posted is prohibited. Okay. So none of our properties are posted as... So Trespass to Property uses a couple of um, a couple of signage mechanisms. One is this green, yellow, and red circles. Green means it's pretty much wide open. Yellow means there are permitted uses, but everything else is prohibited. And red means no trespass, which I think. Um, so all of our none of our properties are posted as green. They're all posted as yellow. And so we and then we have signs that define what those permitted uses are. And so I don't recall horses ever being a permitted use on our properties. So it hasn't been problematic thus far either. Well, I don't think the equestrian people understand or know that it is not a permitted use. Well, well yeah, the yellow no trespassing, that would be interesting that people, general lay people would understand that mm -hmm. distinction. So that, it's a, it's a funny point that is interesting. Sorry, Member Farmer, you have your hand up as well. Question? Uh, yeah, kind of connected um, through the chair to whoever is appropriate. I, um, I used to live beside Ainsley Wood, and certainly there are a number of um, farms and, and folks with horses around there. And the idea that they would maybe ride down the the interior road of the property down to the, the parking area. Um, I wonder if there is a distinction on the properties between what we classify as those kind of interior roads and those uses uses um, and and the general trails, but I'm. There was all there were also perennially problems with uh, fires, sometimes camping. Certainly, a lot of like many people would bring their dog and toss a stick into the water for them. And I just wonder how we enforce something like that or educate if that if your dog can't go in the water in Georgian Bay, I think that would be new for a lot of people. And um, the the difference between what is permitted and what is what is a cultural ubiquitous use? I think there's there's often some distance there, um, and I'm wondering how we communicate or or enforce uh, changes or standards like this. Thank you. Thank you. So, two items. One, I'll step back to the, the horse item for a second. So, section 13 of the regulation that you have there under domestic and other animals. No person shall bring an animal other than a dog or a cat into a conservation area except under permit issued by the authority. So horses under legislation are not permitted unless they have a permit. Um, that's where that stems from. When we talk about can they come into the property on a road, absolutely yes. Um, that's similar to um, you can drive your car on a road, you, where you can, you, you know, we don't want you driving your car around the Arboretum. Um, so yes, the access road, 
the, the horse is your vehicle, as it were, that's absolutely fine. In terms of the, the animal dogs going into the water, we, in the last couple of years, have posted our beaches, so Haibu and so on, with signs like that. We did get calls from people uh, immediately about that, uh, but that that is the law, that is the legislation. And um, there are other places, even at, say, Haibu, where that would be permissible, just not at the main beach where people are, are wading or swimming, like where it's designated as a wading swimming area. So if we use, again, Haibu as the example, there's quite a large stretch of shoreline at that particular property. Uh, so there are opportunities for people to go in the water with their dog, uh, but the main beach is not that area. I hope, hopefully that answers the question. And education is always our preferred uh, route. Fair enough. Any other questions? Member Maxwell. I think the chair, I was just going to say it. Uh, the, the veterinarians in the town of the mountains brought up the issue of health and safety for dogs at large. You know, in the community, just anywhere in the community, whether it be conservation lands or running down the sidewalk. So it's, a, it's an issue. Yeah, it's true. Okay. Um, if that is all, I'll call the vote on that. All in favor? Carried. Leave uh, attachment nine. Uh, administration point B. Uh, CAA and regulation changes. We're going to have a presentation by Matt. Uh, Matt. Oh, you know what? While Mac is preparing, that's a great idea. Let's take a bio break. Probably a good idea. Ten, ten minutes. Three fifteen. Let's get reconvene. Thank you very much. I, I thought we'd be totally done the really right now. Actually, save the thought. Several people yep. from Ken Peasel Barn, they, they go up there and go camping. They, they ride in and camp while they're working and have their work there. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder how that those changes will affect. That's not changing. No, in terms of not, like, is it, didn't it say that no other animals would be permitted to shore? It's always been that way? Oh. 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 Could you? We should look at what the county is over. We should try to coordinate what we allow and what the county allows. People don't really <coughs> differentiate you know, county forest and Saudi Valley forest. I have some so public. We should look at block culture. I, I would suggest that for that we would look at what the best for you. That's a big question. Yeah. You have to go specifically to say things that you don't want horses going up in those halls on the east side of the river. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, there are horses that take crazy up with your shirts on. Oh, yeah. Um, can you try looking And then the. It's interesting to see the water. It's okay. 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 It's
But that's that's often where the conflict comes in is with people who have their dogs off leash and you know, even if you think your dog is free, but you throw a stick out, then the dog's gone. I had to go walk out talking to some people this morning, you know, somebody's walking with their dog on leash, you're just walking beside them. Yeah. I don't care or think about beside me, I'll just mention it to them. But these dogs are all over the yard. Yep. Yep. And and it's not even for people like my dog is very um, anxious with other dogs when he's on leash. So I feel like I can't bring my dog to go for walks on our trails because if another dog came up to him, our dog would take a piece of it. Don't worry. I've seen that. I've seen a dog on leash. My dog is dog not dog necessarily. Oh yeah. He's got big teeth. He's got huge pizza. It's already for me. He's still took a pizza. 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 He's still
Right. 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 Right.
um, build placement or removal. That's, so they've kind of been added development activity, which I think makes sense because in my practice saying development, people are thinking it's like building the structures, but it extends beyond that in practice for us. The regulation limits are proposed to change around wetlands. Um, so right now, what we work with is that provincially significant wetlands, we regulate the wetland in an area 120 meters beyond the wetland. Uh, other wetlands that don't meet that uh, provincially significant criteria are 30 meters from the wetland. And wetlands that are less than two hectares in size, we just regulate the wetland uh, with no area of interference beyond that. The new regulation, we will regulate 30 meters around all wetlands regardless of the type or size. There's some components to the regulation mapping um, that are new, uh, but these are things that we pretty much already do. We have the regulation maps available on our website. Uh, they are reviewed in, uh, once annually and the reports brought forward to the board, usually by Gloria. Um, with the changes, um, where there's significant mapping updates, there should be notice given to the public. Uh, municipalities and stakeholders with at least 30 days uh, notice prior to an authority meeting to consider the changes. So that might be the case where we have substantial changes associated with uh, a floodplain study, for example, that is within a community. Um, in that case, we're going to take it out to, to public consultation or and give notice. Uh, this isn't changing, but it's important to note the regulation is still text-based, uh, and the text prevails where there are disputes in the mapping. So the way I do mapping is really a guide to reflect the text of the regulation. There are now um, exceptions to the prohibitions listed in the regulation. Um, this is new, um, and it's listed, so it's in the regulation itself, so I believe in attachment one to the report. Uh, the exceptions are listed in part and subject in section five of that regulation. I'm not going to go through each one. You can read it and go through it. Um, the the province has labeled these as minor low risk activities. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the risk assessment approach was to this. I think we would have a different opinion on some of them. Some of them we agree with, and they're actually already listed as exemptions under our regulation uh, specific to GSEA. So um, in that case where we have a crossover, obviously the exception can the regulation itself apply. And what you're seeing in our fee schedule is that the GSEA specific exemptions that don't cross over with the regulation are still gonna be there. Now they're not explicitly prohibited or included with the exception in the act. So our current process for providing the exemption will still apply in that if a landowner has a project that meets the uh, exemption that's listed in our key schedule, they'll need to reach out to staff to get that exemption in writing. Otherwise, if it's listed as the exception in the regulation, as long as they're meeting that exception, then they technically don't need any communication from us. Um, so we would prefer that they still reach out to verify that it's an accepted activity, and that's gonna be our recommendation. But if um, someone's undertaking the activity listed uh, in the exception, and it's not subject to the prohibitions of the regulation. There's a pre-submission consultation process that if um, the, an individual um, wants to request that, we have to engage in the pre-consultation process with them. Um, we do pre-consultation all the time, that's not really a problem um, or a challenge, I think. Um, from application requirements. So there is a section in the regulation that lists out what needs to be provided for uh, a firm application. Um, there's a new component to that. There, there's a few new components, but the main one is that there needs to be confirmation uh, of authorization from the owner of the subject property. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. What I've done, if you go to the fee schedule and the attachments, uh, or the firm application and the attachments, I've essentially added exactly the wording in the regulation for what needs to provide for an application as page three, essentially as a checklist for the applicants so that they understand when they're providing the application, they can go through this list and check off what they uh, need to submit to apply 
Arctic is the do good application. Um, there's changes that are now built into the um, legislation about timelines. Um, currently, we operate under timelines in our in our guidance document, but now this will be explicitly built into the legislation. So, when we receive an application and fee, we have 21 days to verify if the application is complete, um, or if it's not complete, what further information is needed to deem the application complete. Um, once it's deemed complete. Uh, we don't have the opportunity to request additional technical studies or reports um, unless it's agreed to by the applicant. Uh, if the applicant is not satisfied with staff deeming their application incomplete, they can request an administrative review. Um, and then once we deem an application complete, we have 90 days to make a decision on the application. Um, there's, if it goes beyond the 90 days, then they have the opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Women's Tribunal. Um, there's conditions of the permit can only be related to the tests and to support the administrative the administration and or implementation of the permit. Um, this part isn't changing. I have in here that hearings um, for a permit are to be referred to by the Board of Directors. There is an opportunity to delegate that uh, the hearings, but our policies still will continue to have it directed to the board of directors. Um, and there is a fee appeal process um, as well if they're not happy with their permit uh, fees. Um, within the regulation, um, there is a requirement for policy and procedure documents to be developed by the conservation authorities. Um, this includes um, policy on pre-submission consultation process and application requirements, administrative reviews, timelines on decisions, and other policies and procedures for administrating, administrating the issuance of permits, um, a process deadline for periodic reviews, a procedure and policy documents, and there's mandatory annual reporting on permit statistics that we'll have to do um, every year. Uh, in terms of canceling a permit, uh, there's a process deadline for that. Um, the permit holder may request uh, a hearing uh, before the board. Uh, the permit holder may request a hearing to confirm, we said, or the decision to cancel a permit. Yes, so that, could, that would be before the board, and then the permit holder can appeal the decision of the board to cancel the permit to the OLT if they uphold the decision to cancel the permit. Um, Permit validity, so the regulation gives the opportunity for permits to be approved up to 60 months, including all extensions. Right now, a 60 month approval would require board approval, um, but under the new regulation, it does not. It can be approved at a staff level. Uh, in our existing fee schedule, there is a 60 month project um, fee that's in there, and it does note that it needs board approval. Under the new fee schedule, I've just taken it that it needs board approval. We rarely see 60 month applications, um, and I don't expect to see many, anyways, with the new regulation, just because the price point of, the, of applying for a 60 month is so high. Um, it wouldn't exactly make economic sense to apply for the 60 month one when you can apply for the two year approval and then extend it in the future. So. There's new powers for the minister. Um, application, applicants can request the minister's review rather than to appeal to the OLT. So in the case when we have a board hearing and the board denies the, the uh, permit application, um, they can choose to either appeal to the OLT or appeal for a minister's review. They can't choose both, they can only choose one or the other, but that avenue is there for them. Um, the minister may issue an order to direct a CA not to issue a permit. Um, I'm not sure under what circumstances that would occur, but it's in there. Um, we also, and this will be in uh, the next slide coming up about <coughs> enforcement, but um, if we were to issue a stop work order, uh, the person we issue the stop work order to can appeal that directly to the minister. So this is the enforcement part, uh, enforcement and defenses. Um, this is, uh, I think this is really good. The maximum fines um, are increased 
to fifty thousand dollars for an individual and up to a million for a corporation. Under current legislation, the maximum fine is ten thousand um, dollars, and so this is a, a good increase, I think, to help uh, make sure that people are being compliant with the regulation and getting their permits. Um, we have a new ability to issue stop work orders. Now, there's some caveats to that and some scenario um, things we have to sort out before we issue a stop work order. But you know, we have to be of the opinion that the activity has caused, is causing, or likely to cause significant damage, um, and damage affects or is likely to affect the test of the regulation. Um, if a person is served with a stop work order, they have the right to a hearing before the board. I think I said they could appeal directly to the minister, but they have to have the hearing first. And then if the board upholds the decision, then they can appeal to the minister on the stop work order. So before I get into questions, I'll just highlight the attachments that I have in the board report. So um, first attachment is the regulation itself. The second one is an interim policy guideline uh, for the administration of the regulation. So essentially this reflects that we have existing policy and guideline documents that um, we will continue to use except where there's variances from the regulation that we're operating with and the new regulation. Where those variances apply, the new regulation will obviously take precedence um, and those variances are outlined um, 1 to 11 within this document. Um, so that's that piece. And then there's a traditional procedures and guideline document. So this document is to reflect on how we're to uh, continue reviewing permit applications that we have existing right now, prior to April 1st. Um, and then once April 1st rolls along, those reviews will still continue with the regulation that are applied for under. Um, but April 1st stands for any application submitted will be under the new regulation. Um, there is a component to this that I think is missing and just trying to get this all done as quickly as possible. And I think it's that we need to have a, a, like a, a sunset clause on this. Like we can't just be continuing to review those permits submitted under the old regulation in perpetuity. Like we have permits that have gone stale or we're waiting to hear from applicants on. Um, so I think I'm going to be bringing this back to the board next month with that piece built into it. But I think for now it's okay to move forward with it as it is and not come back next month to amend it um, to add that a date in there and uh, some language around um, needing to uh, basically stop those reviews after a certain date, especially if they've gone stale. So, um, and if they did want to pick up their application, they can reapply under the new regulation. Um, so that's the piece that's missing on there. But um, otherwise, it's just to set out. Um, Clearly, what staff were to do prior to April 1st with the applications that they have, and then after April 1st, new regulation. Um, and then I have the um, application form, which there's not really any changes to the application form itself. Um, I didn't really need to make any changes to that, but I did add in a checklist on as a page three. And then the fee schedule, um, currently, as you may be aware, the Conservation Authority's fees are frozen by the provincial government. Um, so there's no changes to any of the fee amounts in there. There's just wording changes to reflect the new regulation. Um, and that's included in that. So no changes to the amounts, just wording on there. Um, and I think that's. Yeah, so if there's questions on any of those, I'd be happy to answer. If there's any questions on the regulation itself, I do my best to answer. It's been a shifting landscape very quickly over the past <laughs> six weeks. Yes, yeah, thank you for trying to keep abreast of that. It's no easy task. Uh, are there any questions? Member Maxwell. Um, <clears throat> to the chair, and thank you for the presentation very much. Um, Actually, I don't want to be greedy, but I do have some questions. <coughs> I'm just going to ask two at the beginning, okay? And they're uh, somewhat related. So, when you spoke of water courses, will that apply to man made courses as well? Like, say, encapsulating streams or whatever? Yes. So, um, we don't regulate like municipal roadside ditches, that type of thing. But if there is a man made water course that we feel meets the definition of water course. So what we tend to see is municipal drains, they would continue to be regulated. 
Um, there are ex exceptions to the uh, regulation that specific to municipal drainage uh, works in some situations, but yeah, uh, we would continue to regulate those. There are cases where natural water courses do flow into man-made ditches. Um, in those cases, we do typically regulate those and continue to regulate them unless they go through the ditch to the red line. Uh, sure. Do I have a sure. Uh, so when you spoke of wetlands and provincially mandated uh, wetlands, are they the ones that will be ANSI regulated or how, how are they going to be approached? Provincially significant wetlands? Yeah. yeah. So um, there is an ability to designate wetlands as provincially significant wetlands. There's an Ontario wetland evaluation system. Um, so there are people who are certified to do that type of evaluation and look at wetlands and see if it meets that criteria. Um, an ANSI feature is something different. It's an area of natural and scientific interest. So um, you may have a case where you have a PSW and an ANSI overlap, but an ANSI tends to be areas that aren't necessarily just wetland, like they're, they could be woodlands um, that meet a certain criteria of um, significance. Um, so they are different and there's different evaluations for each one. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, just to follow up on that significant wetland, the provincial significant wetlands. So, we, we're moving from 120 to 30, and um, you know, I, I would think that you know the 120 number would have been implemented in the first place with some good rationale, and now we're moving to 30. So, just wondering, you know. Um, if you can maybe comment on implications of of that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the provincial's direction to do so. We're, we don't really have the choice not to do it. Um, for the most part, where we've seen a lot of development within that 120, there are, it depends on what you're looking at. Uh, like, we see a lot of permits where it's just someone building a garage or a house and it's 100 meters from the wetland. Usually, no impacts at all to that wetland. Those permits have been very easy to work through. Um, and we even had some ex uh, exemptions in our fee schedule to reflect like really minor development 50 meters away from the wetland. Uh, obviously, that's gone now because the limit's 30. So it's really project specific. Um, the planning, the PPF, the provincial policy statement, will still have that 120 meter. Um, buffer land to it for consideration of impacts from a natural heritage perspective, unless the province changes that. Um, but yeah, for the most part, the average person doing work on the property and development in, the, in that area doesn't have an impact. The 30 meter buffer, that's where you're getting closer to the wetlands, so we would potentially have concerns depending on the, ultimately how close that development settles next to the wetland. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really contextual, but if you're getting really beyond that that 30 meters, then for the most part, we weren't seeing a lot of concern there in the projects that we reviewed. Thank you. I have a very related question. I appreciate you asking that one. I was curious about the ecological principles and hazard management behind those numbers. I'm also curious with, is there, I understand 30 meters. Are there other variables that go into deciding whether or not it's ecologically sound and safe to build next to a wetland in terms of elevation or type of soil or is, is it enough to look at distance that, or are there other factors that need to be considered? Yeah, you could have additional kind of overlapping regulated components to it. So for example, the wetland might be defined by its wetland boundary of vegetation and water coverage, but there could be a floodplain that goes beyond that. Um, that you don't see regularly, and that would be an extension of the regulation separately because it would be a floodplain relation, uh, regulation. Um, so it's possible, and then also with wetlands, um, tend to have unstable soils associated with them, so those soils could extend beyond the wetland itself. Um, so within that 30 meters, you know, we could ask for, for example, the soil analysis to be done to make sure that where that building is going is has properly soils there that's properly uh, proper for foundations. Um, so that's something we can be asking for. Um, Do we ask for that already or is that something It depends that's... on 
it, yeah, permit, the, the permit application requirements are application driven, like site specifically what's going on there, we'll make that assessment when we're looking at that proposal and that property. They're not just playing it across the board. May I ask an unrelated Certainly. question as well? Um, with the um, exemptions, the low risk activities, uh, I just, I, I'm curious if there's any that we should pay particular attention to being unregulated down that just to have it on our radar or something I, when it comes through. I do think it's going to put a little more stress on municipalities and building departments, depending on where these structures are located. Um, so one of them is, for example, the last one is the reconstruction of a non-habitable garage with no basement. If the, if the reconstruction does not exceed the existing footprint of the garage and does not allow for a change in the potential use of the garage to create a habitable space. So you could have an existing garage in a floodplain that if the landowner wants to reconstruct it and they're following this specifics of the regulation, they don't need our permit, but it's still in the floodplain versus before if it needed our permit, we would do what we can to get that garage outside of the floodplain and so it's safe for that landowner and future landowners. So there's things like that that are concerning. Um, some of those, like the uh, non habitable accessory building or structure um, or the unenclosed uh, detached deck or patio, it only specifies that there's a certain size to them and that they can't be within a wetland or water course. But, there's other hazards that could be a concern to them that then they could go within. And so you could put a patio at the top of a steep slope, for example. Drainage is now coming straight off that patio. I mean, it still needs to meet that 15 square meters or less, but that can cause an erosion issue. Um, and we actually saw in another presentation uh, a few weeks ago from STA that they had that exact situation. And it's just a minor landscape patio, but drainage is not being funneled right at the top of the steep slope, then the slope is scaling. So the patio is just a matter of time before it goes with it. So stuff like that is concerning. Um, yeah. It, <laughs> and, and that becomes a responsibility of our municipal and county planners? If, to if, if it requires permission from them um, under a site alteration bylaw um, or a building permit, but I'm not sure. Some of those could go through without any yes. permits at all. Yeah. So it would be the responsibility of the homeowner or the yeah. Yeah. Member Max, anybody else want to uh, or not? <laughs> You're up. Okay, so this question is, pertains to um, the permitting process. So when I think of a permit, I sometimes think of an individual permit, but are we also talking about subdivisions being permitted? Yes, yeah, so once the subdivision, like if they go through the planning process, and if there's alterations associated with that work, so roads or even the houses associated with that subdivision that fall within the regulated area, those specifics would need a permit. Perfect. Okay, so my follow up to that then is. So you, you mentioned sunset clauses, potentially, sunset clauses. Will they be, will you be working in cooperation with the municipalities to develop sunset clauses that mirror their sunset clauses? Because we're working towards that because as municipal or developers line up in the queue for services, we want to make sure that they're not just parked there waiting. Yeah, so, so what I'm meaning by the sunset clause is so we refer to applications we have currently open um, and, and having a cap of how long that application can continue for under the old regulation. They could still simply apply under the new regulation at any time if they want. Um, yeah, it, it's just two different pieces of legislation too. Okay. So, my thinking around that is we do have guidelines on how long an application can sit stale or dormant before we're supposed to reach back out to the applicant to ask if they want to continue forward with it. So I think that's what I'm going to refer back to that document for what that period of time is. And that's probably what I'm going to come forward with, except they're not going to give the option of continuing forward with the old regulation. They'll just simply, that, that application is closed, they'll need to reapply to the new regulation if they want to. 
but then the new regulation has dates that, as I mentioned, you know, we don't make a decision on a permit that's be complete within 90 days, they can appeal to the OLT if they want to. Okay, thank you. And we're doing. Um, so, so as things are shifting, um, and once all this sort of settles, um, how is staff feeling, and what are the implications on staff? Are, are you going to be feeling busier, more stressed, or less so, or just what are the implications on staff? Um, we're busy. We're always busy. Uh, stress is. It, there's always a component of stress in planning and permitting, uh, but I think. Uh, we're professionals at what we do. We are we're carrying forward with this new regulation. We don't have a choice. Um, I've been doing everything I can to make sure we have everything aligned so that the transition is as easy as possible for the staff in our day to day operation. Or it's been really helpful in setting up our online permitting application so that this weekend, for example, will happen uh, before the weekend's over or starts. Um, the online application form is going to be taken down. And then the new one's going to be brought up on Tuesday so that we're not getting, because if the new reg comes into effect on the first, we don't want people applying for the old reg over the weekend. Um, so that's an example. We've been working to do that. And so far, it, it's been on kind of the administrative side of things in the last few weeks. But next week, um, once we start rolling with new regulation, we're going to be keeping a close, close eye on it with the staff. and. Uh, we've already built in some mechanisms so that we're mindful of the timelines. And I think right away, I think it's just going to be pretty normal. We'll see how it goes, though, over the next few weeks and months. Great. But I think everyone's feeling okay about it. Great. Number two. Thank you. Uh, I think I know the answer to this already, but I feel like I would like to ask. Um, with the depressions that Conveyed water temporarily. Those are no longer regulated, from what I understand. They no, of course, they no longer, they no longer count as a water course, so they're no, no, no longer regulated. Is anyone planning on tracking the impact of, of that in terms of we've lost, I think, up to 72 percent of wetlands in Ontario over the years. So those depressions could be very valuable to migratory birds, migratory wetland birds passing through, um, and I just wonder if anyone is paying attention to Not that I'm aware of. Um, and um, what we're going to do, though, is we're going to keep the mapping of those features as is. Like, it's too big of a task to go through and decide at a desktop level that this shouldn't be regulated anymore. So as proposals come up, and there's, they're on that property, then if you have a water course that's questionable uh, within the definition, We'll look at it site specifically and make a call on that. So, we're not just going to suddenly take all these water courses out of our mapping. Um, we'll do that on a case by case basis. Thank you. There are no other questions. I just have one. With the um, under your what change, you've had application process and timelines. Interestingly, that this is skewed actually a little bit both ways at times. It's nice to see the higher fines for. Um, for people that aren't following. The one that said no additional technical studies or reports can be requested unless agreed by the applicant. I don't know many applicants would be going, sure, bring on more reports. I'd love to see that. Just wondering, does that come up often? And like, why, why would that come up? It does not come up often, in my experience. It can come up with really complex files, though, as you get into them, because the initial screening is supposed to be a very high level, like, okay, this is what we understand your proposal to be, you're going to need this type of study, and this is not intended to be like a detailed review, but we're going to have to be very thorough in that initial screening and being sure we're covering all our bases um, so that all those studies do come in. The other part of it is that they can't agree to it, so if it's an issue where we can't move forward with improving the project, we'll say that. and. They can decide if they want to then come to a board hearing and, and make their case uh, or not. So, uh, or do the study, and if that study helps to um, make the project so that we can improve it, then that's the best case scenario for everybody. But yeah, yeah we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, if there's no other discussion, I'll, the motion reads, whereas the provincial government approved Ontario Regulation 41-24, prohibited activities, exemptions, and permits under subsection 28 bracket 1 of the Conservation Authorities Act, effective April 1st, 2024, and whereas certain documents, guidelines, and procedures are required to support the transition to Ontario Regulation 41-24, that the GFCA board of directors approve the following. Interim policies and guidelines for the administration of the implementation of Ontario Regulation 41-24, transitional procedures and guidelines, and permit application form and fee schedule. May I have a mover and seconder, please? Member Greg. And Member Maxwell. Uh, there's no further discussion. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you, Max. Uh, next, we have a uh, under administration, <coughs> excuse me, uh, point C, the interim administrative review policy that's attachment number 10 in your package, and Tim Land, the AACIO, will be addressing. So, this is further to what Mac was just talking about with the changes under uh, Ontario Regulation uh, 41 24. Uh, under there, as, as Mac had mentioned, there are some new timelines that didn't apply previously. One of those is that within 21 days of receiving um, the documents listed as necessary for an application within the, um, the regulation, as well as payment of the fee, the Conservation Authority must notify the applicant in writing whether or not the permit application is considered complete. Once that happens, or if that doesn't happen, so let's start with that. If, if we don't provide that within 21 days, the applicant can request an administrative review to say, is my application complete or not? If we do provide it to them and the applicant disagrees with our determination of what a complete application is, they can ask for an administrative review. And finally, if we tell the applicant, this is what we need to see uh, for your application, so an example, they're building a floodplain, and we ask for a floodplain study, and they say, I don't think that's reasonable. Uh, they can request an administrative review. So under the legislation, we, if we receive that request in writing, we must, within 30 days, uh, provide that administrative review and confirm uh, either that uh, the application is complete or provide reasons why it's not, or confirm that the request uh, is reasonable, or scale it back if we believe that the request was not reasonable. Um, the authority, being the Board of Directors, uh, is tasked with this, but they, uh, the legislation allows for the Board to delegate that power to either a subcommittee or to any person. Uh, I am proposing through this uh, interim policy that the that delegated to the CAO of the authority. So what would happen is Mac and his team would do the work that they do, and if one of those triggers happens, the person submits a request for administrative review, I would undertake that review within 30 days and provide a decision and a response on that, or the CAO would, would do so. One thing that we've added in this policy that the legislation does not require, and it's over and above, is if that person does not agree with the CAO's decision, they can bring it to the board. Uh, I put that in there as just another step, a sort of client service type thing, uh, but what it also does is that 30 days no longer applies, because we will have met our requirement under the Act to review it and provide it. And the reason that's important is we schedule our board meetings, uh, the, the materials for our board meetings well in advance, and 30 days is just not going to cut it. So what we've put in the interim policy is that uh, at the next available board meeting, so if we're sitting here today and we're looking at the April and April's already filled up, maybe it's May, but maybe it's April. Uh, it wouldn't be stretching beyond that. So what this allows us to do is meet the criteria of the, um, the legislation, provide that extra level of customer service if we need it. Some of the other things that I've written into the policy with regards to whether or not it comes to the board is some information that we took directly from our previously approved fee policy is that at the CAO's level, there would be discretion to decide if this is uh, frivolous or vexatious, the request to go to the board, or if the board has already uh, 
pass judgment on something of similar, substantially similar. So what we don't want is uh, somebody who, maybe it's a contractor and they're frequently applying for permits and every single time they say, I want to take this to the board. Maybe the first time we would say yes, and then if they come back and it's the same thing, we would just say, no, sorry, this is frivolous or vexatious. Um, I would hope that's not going to happen, but it's nice to have that clause in there to address that should it happen. Otherwise, I think this is pretty straightforward. We've put some things in, into the document that are necessary in terms of frequency of review, uh, notice and public availability, and transition. Uh, so notice and public availability it will be on our website on the under the uh, I'm envisioning it being under the uh, environmental planning section as well as under the governance section. So people can look at either location and find it. And, um, and then in terms of the transition, um, the if the board approves it today, then it would take effect on April 1st when the new regulation takes effect. I've listed it as an interim policy because we've been told by Conservation Ontario that they are developing a policy for this. Uh, we haven't seen it yet, and April 1st is, is limited. So we've written a policy, it works. Uh, if theirs is better, we will take it or borrow from it, or maybe this will come back to the board, but in the interim, uh, this should cover everything. So the request uh, is that uh, the board approve the policy, and that by default would uh, delegate the power to the, the CAO to provide the administrative review should they need come up. Seems pretty straightforward. Any question? Remember it? Just one. Uh, first, though, I do want to thank you and the rest of the staff for your very timely response to this new legislation. We did feel very. It's mostly not casting. It feels very streamlined. Um, and my, while you were talking, I just wondered if, when, if someone takes an issue to you and then to the board, does that affect the 90 day? Was it a 90 day deadline? That we have to get the final. So that would be out. the application is not even complete yet. Okay. So if you didn't even complete, then the 90 day starts. Thank you. Oh, that great. Uh, the only comment I would make, and always in support of the recommendation here, is uh, coming into the meeting, I thought the 30 days, the policy responded to the fact that one month you could have a meeting on the 22nd, 23rd, 24th. And then by the time you flip then you can go beyond 30 days or maybe we miss a meeting. So the, just the, um, the communication that, that we can't put it on in the, or that we're doing it because we can't add the item to an agenda. I'm not totally comfortable with it because I'm used to just pivoting and, and adapting in, in business sense all the time. So I just wanted to say that, that, um, that, that's not what I was expecting. I just thought it would be the other way. And, and if the occasion occurred that it had to come forward, that whether the board sat for an extra half an hour or and, and staff had to prepare that report, that's just that's that's what we have to do. Um, so I was just surprised to hear it um, put that way. But and, and that absolutely works. I, I think though the case could come up where maybe the example I gave was extreme, but maybe uh, instead of that example. Let's instead say Monday, this happens. I'm not going to get it on Wednesday's yeah. agenda, right? So it's going to have to go to the next available board meeting. But certainly the intent is not to draw it out longer than it needs to. And we are going over and above what the regulation requires here. I would also think that there's always the additions to the agenda opportunity in the, uh, in the agenda itself that if something emergency status arose, that it couldn't be presented even above and beyond the planning. Member Maxwell. So uh, <clears throat> the fact that we're the conservation authority would be going above and beyond uh, what's required, will that weigh better at an OLT decision on behalf of the municipality? And, and on behalf of the authority. And, and the municipality. Sometimes they're tied together for a permit. It would have nothing to do with the municipality in this case. No. The municipality is completely separate from our permitting process. But I do believe that if the person decided to, um, I don't actually think there's an opportunity for them to appeal this to the OLT. But if they appealed the 90 days to the, if we got to there somehow, 
uh, and, and the um, complete application process was brought up for some reason, then yes, us doing more than we legally have to would definitely weigh in our favor. Okay. Anyone else? If not, I will read the motion. Whereas Grace Alpha Conservation Authority must review and issue permits under the Conservation Authorities Act, and whereas the Ontario Regulation 41-24 stipulates that an authority must have a policy related to the review of a complete application, that the Grace Alpha Conservation Authority Board of Directors approve the attached interim administrator review policy as attached. May I have a mover and a second, please? Uh, Member Carlton, Member Dubik, all in favor? Carrie, thank you. Also, Mr. Landier, continue to address uh, point D of our administration, the delegation of officers. Try to keep this one super quick. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give you the Coles notes. If you have questions that require more details, please ask. Uh, we have officers um, designated under Section 30 of the Conservation Authorities Act to enforce Section 28. So Section 28 is our development regulation that Max spoke to. Section 29 is the work that we do on our own properties. We already have those officers designated. We need to redesignate them because there's a new regulation for both pieces of legislation, uh, for both uh, sections of the Act. Uh, no new officers are being designated by this process, and the board report stipulates uh, who those officers are and when they received their, uh, or what board motion it was that they received their, uh, that they were approved as officers under. Uh, the process that we go through is all officers must undergo a minimum level one training before we designate them as officers, and then after that, where it's appropriate, they would undertake level two. So typically, uh, max team under section 28 would do level two, Morgan's team under Section 29 would not because it has to do with uh, taking people to court, uh, getting warrants, things like that. So it's it's much more the um, Part 3 of the Provincial Offenses Act, laying a charge or information as opposed to issuing a ticket um, type of thing. So I'll leave it there. If the board has any questions, by all means, but otherwise it's trying, just trying to maintain the status quo. Any questions? Member Rick? Will staff get tasers to be able to take care of these dogs in their properties? I'll move the recommendation. It's not what they mean by charging people, Scott. Fair enough. If there's no comments, I will read the motion. Whereas Grace Alpha Conservation Authority must monitor compliance with the Conservation Authorities Act and, where appropriate, enforce the provisions of that act. And whereas certain staff have completed the appropriate provincial offenses officer training, that the Great Salvo Conservation Authority Board of Directors designate Tim Landier, McLean Cleus, and I apologize for any pronunciations, Olivia Stroka, and Chris Schultz as a provincial offenses officer under the Conservation Authority Act and Ontario Regulation 41 24 for Section 28 and Section 30 related offenses. And that the Great Salvo Conservation Authority Board of Directors designate Tim Lampier, Morgan Berry, and Spencer Young as Provincial Offices Offenses Officer under the Conservation Authorities Act and Ontario Regulation 688-21 for Section 29 and Section 30 related offenses and to enforce the Trespass to Properties Act. May I have a little for a second, please? Mr. Bell and Mr. Day, thank you. All in favor? Thank you. <coughs> Let's give me a break from reading so you can speak again. Um, uh, point E under the administration designation of power under CAA. Thank you. Um, so again, uh, moving forward into the new regulation, we need to make sure that all of the approvals are appropriate to the legislation that is currently in effect versus the legislation that is no longer going to be in effect. Um, so we need currently staff are delegated with the authority to issue permits, not to deny permits. Um, and so staff have signing, signing authority to issue those permits. Currently, those staff that have that authority are the CAO, the Manager of Environmental Planning, and the Water Resources Coordinator. 
moving forward, we're proposing that it be the CAO, the manager of environmental planning, and the, Envi and the manager of engineering services. And so what this means is that permits uh, do not have to come to the board of directors for approval before they go out the door, um, but rather they're signed at a staff level. This has been the case uh, formally since 2013, and prior to that, staff were signing the permits and they were coming to the board for rectification after that. So this has been this the practice for 20 years or more. It works, it provides more timely issuance of permits. Uh, one other thing that we would add would, is that um, the board can delegate the power to staff uh, or to a subcommittee to notify individuals of pending cancellation of their permit, at which point they would be offered the opportunity to have a hearing before the board. So currently we don't have anything written about that. I'm suggesting that that power of the board be delegated to the CAO, but that the power of the actual hearing for the hearing remain with the board of directors. Um, the legislation allows for the delegation of the power for hearings to a subcommittee or to an individual. I'm not sure that um, that, that complies with other legislation regarding hearings. Uh, so our recommendation is that permits can be signed by the three individuals noted in the staff report, that if we were to need to cancel a permit notification could be authorized by the CAO, but any hearings would come to the board of directors for uh, as the hearing board. Thank you, Jim. Any questions? Okay. I do have one. So if a permit is canceled, maybe yet the municipality may be in the process of issuing the permit. So it's a building permit, it's tied to the conservation, uh, allowing somebody to do something. How does that fit? We would probably notify the building official that we were planning to do this if it were so tight to the wire that our permit had been issued and the building permit hadn't yet been issued and we were canceling it. It's more likely, and that would be one way in on this, but it's more likely that somebody is doing something that's uh, grossly outside of the permissions of their permit, and so their permit's going to be withdrawn on those grounds. Yeah, no, I agree with that. So the, the situation that we would cancel a permit, I foresee, would be one, they provided false and misleading information in their application that we became aware of, or they're doing something on the site beyond what they were approved for. Um, those would be the two, but then we would notify, the agreement would would notify the municipality in that case, just as a precaution. But the, the odds of the building permit hadn't been issued yet are probably low. Um, Any other comments, questions? If not, talk a lot. Another one. Uh, whereas the Grace Oval Conservation Authority must review and issue permits under the Conservation Authorities Act, and whereas the board may delegate its power in this regard, that the Grace Oval Conservation Authority Board of Directors delegate powers relating to the issuance or renewal of permits to the Chief Administrative Officer the manager of environmental planning and the manager of engineering services, and that the Grace Oval Conservation Authority Board of Directors delegate powers relating to providing notice of the cancellation of a permit to the chief administrative officer. May I have a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Member Dubik, Member Bell. I'm oh, sorry, Member Farmer hasn't gotten in on the fund today yet, so I'm going to second that member. Perfect. All in favor? Thank you very much. Uh, the business items, uh, water management, environmental planning, operations, conservation lands, forestry, communication, public relations, and uh, there are, there's nothing to report at this time, so we'll move to education and the education fees update. Uh, it's attachment 13 in your package. Try to make this one quick as well. <laughs> so this is an update to our education fee schedule. Um, I think the term update is a bit loose since we haven't really had a fee schedule for this previously, other than summer day camp fees. So 
As you'll likely recall, back in October, we presented to you our environmental education framework. Um, and through that document, we're hoping it will, well, it is helping to shape the environmental education programming that we're offering here at Grace Level. So since we presented that framework to you, we then circulated it to partners, stakeholders, and educators across the region. We reached out to the school boards, um, sent it out to their staff, along with a survey that sought, sought feedback on certain things like our high level programming, the types of programming that we offer, the length, the location, that type of information, as well as the fees. We received 20 responses to this survey, so numbers were a little low, that's a bit disappointing, um, but we did, it was valuable feedback that we did receive. And out of the 20 responses, nine offered feedback on curriculum and education. And out of these, um, in the questions that asked about fees, two, two people stated that costs are not feasible with no grant subsidies, and seven stated that they are absolutely feasible. Um, as you recall, as you, you'll recall, the 2024 budget contains no levy contribution towards education and instead draws from several sources that includes the foundation, um, user fees, uh, and then to a lesser degree grants um, and hopefully sponsorships. So we are seeking further grant funding and creating that sponsorship program that we presented to you and spoke about at that October board meeting and that will help us to reduce these costs. So in terms of figuring out what fees we should charge, we have done quite a bit of research, uh, reached out to other CAs, and we've compared fees from 18 different conservation authorities. There are 36 CAs in the province. There were only 18 that either responded or had some had their fees published on the website. So we went through the process of comparing um, different fee structures in terms of half-day and full-day programming. Uh, some offer a per student rate, which is a little bit tricky because regardless, you have to create the programming. So you spend staff, staff time in creating the programming and your staff have to be there regardless of how many students attend the programming. So we've decided to go with a proposal of a half day rate and a full day rate for on-site programs. So in my report, you'll see that the average half-day rate for school-based programming across those 18 different CAs was $216, and the average full-day rate was around $390. Um, this is removing some outliers because there's a lot of different factors at play, like I said, with when you're considering the per-student rate um, and different considerations. The average for an in-class program was $120 per hour. Per hour. So in this list, we proposed um, that our summer day camp remain the same. Uh, we did have a significant increase for that program last year, and we really want to try and keep that feasible for, for campers, so we left it the same. Um, other day camps, so that is uh, experiential programming that we're hoping to offer. We haven't created it yet, but where we would act as um, experts at other day camps. So other day camps in the area such as the YMCA or grid groups, groups like that that offer programming, we could come in and offer um, programs that we're, we're experts at, basically things like GIS, potentially some of the method programming that we offer, um, watershed health reporting, things like that. Um, we have the half day outdoor school programming and the full day outdoor school programming. So that would be on site programming, and we have those listed as $200 or $400. In school, in, sorry, in class school yard programming, we list it as $100 per hour with an additional fee for any additional time spent there. So if we're anywhere from one to two, it would be an additional $60. One addition to this list that wasn't in the framework is this full day specialist high skills major program. The reason we've added that is we have had a member of the Catholic school board reach out and ask if we offered this type of programming and we are offering it as a pilot project this year, actually in April. So this is really exciting and we've had a lot of conversations with these staff and um, 
500 dollars seems to be a reasonable fee for that. It's a bit more than the 400 dollar full day rate because of the fact that we we're likely going to need more staff assistance because we need those experts to come in and make it a little more intensive than some of the other programming that we're offering. So we've got that few bit. And then finally, the guided hikes and property tours or other community educate activation programs we're um, offering at hundred dollars per hour. That sec second section there um, was in response to some requests and also conversations among staff about a lot of the equipment that we have here that isn't used on a regular basis. And we've had groups like Boy Scouts, Girl Guides, Young Nats, groups like that reach out and ask to use some of the equipment. So we did want to set out some fees for that as well. Um, I've already mentioned this, but it is important to note that we are seeking that grant and sponsorship funding. Um, as we do realize things like the guided hikes, that community activation programming, it is hard to charge fees for that. Um, so we have actually been successful so far in receiving three different funding funders. Um, one, we received twelve thousand dollars for group through Bruce Power for it's a general it was a general grant where we applied for expanding our education programming and um, we will be receiving that soon so that's very exciting. Uh, we've also received a wage subsidy through a federal grant for our day camp supervisor position. So what that's going to allow us to do is hire, rather than having Chelsea Vieira, our environmental educator, act as a day camp supervisor, she can still focus on the other education programming and offer support to day camp, but we can also hire that additional position. So that, that's very, very beneficial to us to be able to do that. And then finally, we are partnering with MNO, Métis Nation of Ontario, to offer, um, and they have some funding for us to offer some guided hikes as well. So we're going to be offering three to four um, programs of guided hikes and potentially including a bio blitz in there at Bogner Marsh with that group. Um, are there any questions to the chair? Thank you, Marie. That's, uh... That's all very optimistic. That's right. Any questions or comments? Uh, Member Gray. My question might have already been answered. Uh, I, it's on the equipment. Yeah. So I think I heard or would interpret what you just said as to the fact we already have that equipment here. We do. So we don't need to go purchase. Um, we, we have the digital microscopes, thanks to a grant through Enbridge over the last few years, um, and snowshoes and binoculars. Um, we do want to do a full inventory of some of that equipment. However, the digital microscopes are brand new, so we definitely have those. And um, we are looking to perhaps do some replacements of some of these other items, but we do all have, to have all that. Equipment. Okay, so it's not like that's a $4,500 line item sitting there to to be purchased. Okay. Yeah, that's that like I said, that stuff that we have sitting here okay. often not being used. Um there would I did put subject to an agreement and available at our discretion because we don't necessarily want members of the public just walking walking in and grabbing a pair of snowshoes. But we do have a lot of partners and stakeholders that might want to be make use of that agreement. I can piggyback on that interestingly like the library, the public library, they have a number of things. They have snowshoes and things like that. If you have a public library card, there's actually no cost to that. Um, if you obviously wanted to, if you were outside, that you could rent them accordingly. Um, I don't know how many people we would have that are actually being GSEA members. That I don't know if you looked at that model at all, since they're already paying as a GSEA, GSEA member, whether that would be one of the benefits. That's a really good point. Um, and I'm actually really glad you brought up the library as well because we are partnering with the libraries on the Environmental Book Club and we've talked about us providing some equipment to them for um, takeaway bins with binoculars and things like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, and actually that's one of the grants that Grouse mentioned. We did get a grant through the aid fund for our Environmental Book Club as well of $1,000. And that will help us buy some some books to top up some of the ones at the libraries, and um, and to purchase other books for here because we're hoping to put up a bookshop here. 
think Member Day had a question first, and then I'm sure you're going to back up. I might have three or <laughs> two, a comment and two questions. Sure. Um, but I'll, I'll start with uh, the rentals since we're on that topic. Uh, I, having been in charge of snowshoes and microscopes and sometimes binoculars, and using them with students, I know that students are. For any rental, it doesn't always come back in the same shape that you sent it out in. So I think, uh, from a cost perspective, having some kind of cost to renting those additional things in addition to the membership fee is not a bad thing because some things will need to be repaired over time or replaced over time. And along with that, if there will there be you said subject to an agreement for the rental, so, so that might include some kind of. If you drop the entire bin of microscopes in the lake, absolutely, it would. There will be a there will be a big concept. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I think the SHS edition, or sorry, the specialist high skills major edition, is a really great idea, and I wouldn't worry about overcharging for that in any way. Um, if you have a school that's interested in partnering with you. Uh, that is where the provincial funding for education is at its highest right now. So it's uh, and we, having run one, we have very we had very strict deadlines of when you had to spend that money by. So it's uh, the cost wasn't necessarily always a problem for the teachers running those. And that's definitely in line with the conversations we've had. So that's that's really really helpful. Mm -hmm. And my last my just my last thought was uh, I was so. Relief for a second to hear about the funding coming in for salaries for the day camp supervisor, and just a feeling a little bit of pressure as someone on the foundation committee as well to continue to fundraise. So I'm just making sure that Chelsea's salary is still being considered as something that will be funded through grants. And yes, um, moving forward for 2024, absolutely, we're. Um, we're, we're, we're continue, we've applied for a lot of grants, so we're very thankful for them we received. Um, but yes, absolutely, we are considering that. So we're applying for and we don't need the grants. Thank you. So, uh, I, I know you're clearly doing yeah, a lot of work around education, and that's really pushing driving forward one of the goals and the strategic plans. Uh, um, that, that's all. <laughs> so thank you. See how um, Wendy made a good point. Just that I, I think when we're talking about identifiable individuals, oh, we should climb point. at that, especially yeah. around salary discussions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Member Maxwell. Yeah. Thank you, uh, to the chair. Uh, uh, so, in your funding policy program you're developing here, so you you know you have identified you're using sponsors and and grants, I guess. So, in order to have it continuous over years, are you breaking this down into a funding streams that are over like three and four years, or are they just one ups? So currently, we're we're working year by year. We we have laid that out in our environmental education framework in terms of what the needs will be and what we need in terms of funding. Um, the Majority of the costs are associated currently with salary and some materials and supplies, and that is coming from user fees through day camp. Um, we do we do make some money off day camp. The foundation has committed to three years of twenty thousand dollars per year of funding, so that's a big help. Um, and then user fees for these offerings that I've listed here. For the mainly to start the curriculum link education and then grants. We also have a very healthy, fairly healthy youth reserve that we will draw on when we need it. I believe there's a portion of that went into the 2024 budget as well. So the Kispin area for your program, how, how large is that area? Well, we are trying to expand. That's one of our goals: is to make it not so Owen Sound centric, but it, so that it is spread across our full watershed. For instance, one of the areas that we really wanted to offer our um, environmental book club was in Blue Mountain, so we are offering that through Thornbury, through the like Blue Mountain Library, um, and we are looking at offering in terms of school-based programming 
have offering absolutely across the watershed outside of Sound. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Tonight I will read the motion. Whereas GSCA must charge fees to cover the costs associated with offering environmental education-based programming as defined in the environmental education framework. And whereas staff have done a comparison of fees charged for this type of programming at other conservation authorities across the province and proposed fees similar to the average of these rates. And further, whereas after consultation with partners, stakeholders, and school staff by an online survey, the majority of responders deemed the fees acceptable. That the GSCA board of directors approve the rates provided in the proposed rates table of this report. Member Hoover and seconder, please. Um, Member Bell and Member Carlton. All in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, rounding out the business items under administration, there's nothing to report for GIS or GWSP, so we will go to the CAO report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so a couple of things I wanted to bring the board up to speed on or keep you in the loop on. Uh, last year in 2023, we ended the year with uh, running a deficit in our environmental planning department, and we pivoted for that with the 2024 budget to um, to restructure how the budget's laid out, where funds are being drawn from and going to, to make sure that we are in a, uh, what we hope to be a more manageable uh, position to, with the, relative to the applicant's commitment. So I'd like to keep you up to date on that, um, including deferred revenues that come from 2023 into 2024. At the end of February, we're sitting at 111% of target budget for that. So we're looking good. Right now, we're ahead of we're ahead of budget, and we'll continue to keep an eye on that through the year. But I think things are are looking positive. Uh, the other thing I would note from that is we we have um, we have we are planning to hire a um, planning assistant right now. This is somebody to handle uh, some of the paperwork and some of the administrative stuff associated in the planning department. There's a lot of paper there that we need to deal with before we move. And, uh, and some other things that they need to deal with. That person is in the budget at the beginning of the year, but we haven't actually hired them yet. So there will be some savings there too. So it gives us a little more wiggle room in that budget. So I think things are looking very, very positive for this year. But if you do, uh, at your leisure, scroll back to the receipts and expenses for this month or back up to the planning applications and permit applications that have come in in February, you'll see that they are quite busy this year and, and the numbers reflect that. Uh, I was going to talk about the Earth, Earth Film Festival, but oh, it's, I'm sorry. No, it's, okay. it's it's been covered and it is in the consent agenda as well. So just encourage everyone to go. It's it's a great evening and it's a great cause, um, and uh, the foundation works really hard on this. It is one of their uh, annual events that they put on. So I'll leave that with you. Um, Tomorrow, I will be attending the Town of the Blue Mountains uh, office. They are hosting the Great Lakes Cities Initiative. And so I'll be attending that along with other members, uh, with other CAOs from other conservation authorities that are involved in the uh, grant application that we have in with the NRCAN to do the, the regional uh, shoreline uh, natural hazards mapping project. So that should be uh, informative. I, this is the first for me. I've, I've never been to one of their meetings. They do travel. They are uh, not always so close by, so it's a great opportunity that it is so close by. Um, and it coincidentally lined up perfectly with the meeting I already had booked at the town, so it works out well. Um, Gray County EMS has contacted us. They like to do training annually up at Inglis Falls, uh, high ropes training for the cliffs there. And they will be there again at the end of April, beginning of May. So it's a great partnership um, to have them be able to come into the properties. And so it's uh, it's EMS, fire, police that do this training, and uh, it's it's really good for the community having these skills, and it's obviously really good for Grace Sobel too. In terms of as an owner of many of these properties, it's good to know that uh, there are skilled staff uh, in our community that can help in an emergency. And finally, uh, just a quick update on where we're at with the strategic plan process. So it's moving along. We've broken it into what we're considering four phases. The phase of internal or initial internal review and consultation is complete. 
And we're moving now into uh, our second phase, which is consultation and data collection. So this will include a series of surveys. Um, one is to you as the board of directors. You should see that next week. Um, there's a staff satisfaction or employee satisfaction survey that will go to staff, um, a survey for our volunteer groups, um, a survey for our partners and stakeholders, and we've actually subdivided off our municipalities from that to uh, have one that's directly uh, focused on councils and senior staff at our municipalities to, um, to see how each of you and your counterparts feel that the relationship is with the Conservation Authority, feel uh, about how you feel about the work that's being done by the Conservation Authority. And the reason that we're also sending it to senior staff is, uh, in my experience, going to council tables uh, over the last couple of years, sometimes get a, a comment from councillors about it would be great if you were more involved with our municipality, only to have a staff person speak up and say, we deal with race all, all the time. So there's a different perspective, right, that council doesn't always see. And so it would be nice to have those two components coming together. Um, we'll also be holding uh, two public meetings, and those are already scheduled. So we booked the Bayshore in Owen Sound for April 25th. The idea is to host municipal staff and, uh, and councils in the afternoon, and to host the general public in the evening. And then we'll be doing another one at Meaford Hall on April 29th. So it's a Thursday and a Monday, and same idea, uh, municipal staff and councils in the afternoon and public in the evening. We'll put the invitation for both dates out to everybody. So if you can't make one, hopefully you can make another, uh, recognizing that we couldn't possibly try to plan around uh, municipal schedules and, and satisfy everybody. So we're hoping this will do that. In terms of the surveys that we're sending out, um, we will be sending them directly to partners, stakeholders, and so on. For clients, it will go on our website, it will go in our email signatures, and we're also to address people that maybe uh, aren't included on a computer. We have talked to our municipal partners and our library partners, and we're going to be putting hard copies of these in all of the municipal offices and all of the local libraries so that people can also fill them in that way. And in addition to the satisfaction surveys, we're also, we also have a form that people can fill out about what do you actually want to see the Conservation Authority doing. So this is the piece that actually speaks to uh, what we're proposing as goals in the strategic plan. So that's a quick update right now. I'll try to keep the board uh, updated as we go along, and there will, in our um, in our timeline, there are touch points with the board for decision making uh, or for feedback. And, and the, the next feedback piece you should be getting next week in terms of that board governance survey. So through you, Mr. Chair, if anybody has any questions about those things, I'm happy to answer them. I just have those dates again for um, for the events that we will be collectively invited to. April 25th is a Thursday, and April 29th is a Monday. And we'll send those out more formally to a member of our Sorry, one other thing uh, is that you are already aware of this, but we did unfortunately have to cancel the volunteer event scheduled for next week due to lack of response. So we're going to reschedule it for late summer, and we've requested feedback from the various volunteer uh, members to say, to, and just ask why. What, what was it the time of year? What the location? Um, what was it? So that we can try to make something that is, uh, that's going to work better and have a higher rate of attendance. Um, but still tend to go forward with it. It's just unfortunate that we did have to cancel the, the one that we had to do. Thank you. Uh, Member Maxwell. Sure. Yeah, the question was April 29th or April 25th. Uh, who, who, who's allowed to attend? Are you allowed, is your spouse allowed to attend with you or something like that? Or? So during the day, we would ask that it's municipal councillors and staff, and in the evening, it's the general public. And we will be sending out invitations to, to the various locations. All right. Okay. Thank you. Nothing else. Thank you, Tim. Um, uh, sure, what I was actually going to mention, obviously, it very sad 
sorry, 150th. We're trying to get me further as much as possible. Um, and it's uh, it was very sad to hear that that had to be just um, had to be canceled. So yeah, by the same extension, if there's anything we can do to assist with trying to you know, reach out and get more participation, you know, we would love to see, make this a successful event. Um, secondary thing I was going to mention was I <laughs> attended with Member Dave Carlton yesterday uh, a very interesting media training event for counselors. It was actually, I, I think, most people that I spoke with agreed that it was a very good day, a very important day. The one takeaway I thought I took away that was germane to this organization was um, it was Ryan Lambie of uh, Red Brick that made the presentations and he spoke about how. Um, dealing with general public, I use the term phrase dumbed down, and I think he took me to task rather well on that. Um, but really, if for most, um, reaching out to target audiences, most things need, they said, he said, really need, today need to be written at about literally a fourth or fifth grade uh, level. And he finds municipal staff, who there were many there in attendance. Um, and counselors quite guilty of being more in that 12th or 13th level. He did then point it out that he said that he found conservation authorities in particular were the more even higher <laughs> levels uh, in terms of forms of communication. So if there was any kind of takeaway, it was about how can we, you know, clarify the message or make it a little more simplistic so that uh, general public and heck, general public uh, board of directors. Uh, make it easier to understand uh, whatever. And we, we've tried to say that up to our own staff who were in the room. It's just about some of the staff reports you get are very well entrenched and, and remote, and sometimes less is better. So just sort of an interesting takeaway that um, sometimes showing off our university degrees isn't a good thing. So that's all I had for that. Thank you. Um, there is no post session today, so with that, I will move to adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. But Eddie, Eddie is right, because you read a staff report. And you just, I couldn't say that much easier. You know, it's, yeah, and, and I don't want to blame them, because they're well written.